George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan hits the latest regime change operation out of Washington to the boundary. But the ball didn't disappear over the pavilion. It will soon be back in play. In fact, Imran Khan's life is now in danger and an assassination plot has already been thwarted. His security stepped up. President Tokayev of Kazakhstan also has just survived an assassination attempt. His intelligence service capturing a foreign man with a foreign imported rifle ready to snipe him out of politics in the Central Asian Republic. Kyrgyzstan has already suffered its coup. Somebody is busy in Central Asia and in South Asia. I wonder who it can be and why it can be. We'll be talking about Pakistan, about Imran Khan, and of course about the war which drags on, a bloody and unnecessary war which drags on in the Ukraine. A war between the United States and Russia. Don't be fooled that this war is anything other than that. And we'll be visiting Germany by virtual reality, of course, where the trade unions and the manufacturers have woken up to the fact that Joe Biden just destroyed their lunch. Joe Biden just destroyed their economy. All the while, the Americans have stepped up the importation of Russian oil and abandoned sanctions on fertilizer. What a lot of merd. It's all coming up over the next three hours on the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. It is, of course, a global university of the airwaves and an open one. And there are no tuition fees. But there is something important tonight that we have never done before. And this is episode 150. You already know that we had to lose, pause, uh, the extra mother of all talk shows on Wednesday nights, replaced by an entirely free uh, Galloway show, which did fantastically well for a first sighting. Uh, 59,000 views on it, I think, and the podcast of it uh, doing record business, business for free. And this is still free, and you can watch it. Uh, if you can't pay or if you won't pay. Uh, but I'm asking you this week for the first time to make a donation by PayPal. The button will come up throughout the show so that we don't lose the mother of all talk shows. I'm currently seeking a sponsor for this show. If you are someone that could sponsor it, please get in touch with me or 10 sponsors, or 50. Uh, but until we get a sponsor, the show is in danger, which would be a very great pity indeed, because the average audience of this show over the last month has been 1.1 million people, making it the biggest political show on the planet, at least on the English-speaking planet, which, as our rulers know, is, of course, the only part of the world that matters. And it's because we don't think like that, that we have managed to get viewers from every single part of the world. Our podcast is number one, I think, in Singapore, of all places. It came in at number one in Tanzania last week, entered the charts at number one. So we are a prime broadcasting asset. 
we just don't have any money. So we need the viewers from now on to support this show if we're going to guarantee its success. If you all gave $10 each, we'd have enough to go nightly. If you all gave $5 each, ditto. If you gave $1 each, we'd be sitting pretty and secure for the rest of the year. That's what I'm asking you to do. Give what you can on PayPal. Now, as I said at the beginning, Imran Khan confounded the regime change operation in Pakistan uh, with a boundary. He hit the Americans for six, but they haven't gone away, you know. The background to this is important. My background to this is important. In front of me, you'll see two of my proudest possessions. I hope that you can see them. They are my awards from Pakistan given over decades. I hold the two highest civil awards in Pakistan, the Halale Qadi Azam and the Halale Pakistan. I have a deep and long association with that country. There they are, a wonderful Roman uh, staff here, and uh, they have pride of place in my household. I want to talk about Imran Khan. I'm not his party man. Let me make that clear. Partly because I spent decades, literally three decades, at the side of the late Benazir Bhutto, the then leader of the Pakistan People's Party. I even campaigned for her in 1988 when she became uh, the first uh, woman prime minister in the Muslim world. I was with her throughout. I spoke to her just hours before she was murdered in Rawalpindi in Pakistan when she returned yet again to contest a general election. So I'm not an Imran Khan party man, but I do absolutely respect him. I've had good relations with all of the leaders of Pakistan, with Benazir Bhutto, with Nawaz Sharif, and with Imran Khan. But Imran Khan is a friend of mine, and I respect him absolutely. If it wasn't for the day that he's just had in Pakistan and the hour that it is in Pakistan now, he'd be on the show here with me now, and I hope that he will be here next week. The United States National Security Council took a decision to regime change Imran Khan. Pakistan, a country of 220 million people, just like that, the National Security Council decided that their prime minister had to go. How's that for interfering in other countries' politics? They conveyed it through under Secretary of State Mr. Lu L. Yu, who actually wrote it in a letter to the leaders of the opposition in Pakistan in terms, and I paraphrase, but only just a paraphrase. The letter said that relations between the United States and Pakistan would not improve as long as Imran Khan remained Prime Minister and that the only way that uh, relations could improve is if an election were to return someone else as prime minister. As clear an intervention in someone else's sovereign affairs as it is possible to imagine. Unfortunately for the United States, this letter found its way into the hands of Imran Khan. The proximate reason for it is obvious enough. Pakistan has the closest possible relations under all prime ministers, indeed even under military dictators in the past, with the People's Republic of China, its neighbor. And that was difficult for a United States bent on regime change in Beijing to handle in the first place. But on the first day 
of the Russian military operation in Ukraine. Where was Imran Khan? He was in Moscow signing a deal with President Putin to receive at knockdown prices a guarantee of Russian gas and a guarantee of Russian wheat in order to heat his people, in order to feed his people, in order to keep the wheels of industry turning for his people. In other words, he was doing his job, his duty as the Prime Minister of Pakistan. But this double harness of a Pakistan in closer cooperation with Russia and in an ironclad alliance with China lit a fuse which they hoped, still hope, would lead to the explosion of Imran Khan's premiership. They put together a motion of no confidence which the Speaker just kicked out of Parliament this very day because it was the fruits of a foreign conspiracy and because Imran Khan had already asked the President of the country to dissolve the National Assembly and hold general elections within 90 days. General elections, which I confidently predict, will see Imran Khan sweep the country if the United States does not ensure that the army whose top brass are playthings of the United States and always have been Ever since the country was created, the military which hanged the martyr, Zofikar Ali Bhutto, the military which overthrew elected prime ministers like Nawaz Sharif, like Benazir Bhutto, if the military rigs the election, uh, then there will be serious trouble in Pakistan, a mighty country in a strategically vital place in the world and, of course, in possession of a fleet of nuclear weapons. It doesn't get much more dangerous than that. Even worse, they may kill Imran Khan, their cricketing hero, their prime minister who has stood tall and been visible throughout the world as a champion of justice in Pakistan, in Asia, and in the world. And it's the fear of assassination which has led the government in Pakistan to step up the Prime Minister's personal security because they became aware of a plot to murder him. So if you are a religious person, uh, then pray for the safety of Imran Khan. Not just because He's a fine and noble political figure, but because the murder of Imran Khan would be an extremely catastrophic event in the history of South Asia and in the history of the world and would set in motion events potentially cataclysmic in their importance. We'll be taking calls, of course, they're sleeping in Pakistan now, but we'll be taking uh, calls on this subject. There are millions of overseas Pakistanis around the world. Uh, the uh, government has acted uh, swiftly before leaving office this evening. Uh, they have dismissed the discredited governor of the Punjab, one Mohammad Sarwar, a former parliamentary colleague of mine. I've known him as a loyal supporter of every single party in Pakistan. He's a man that has betrayed everyone that ever helped him, everyone that ever worked with him, including me. If I were to tell you the even bare bones of his serial betrayals, well, we wouldn't have anything else on the show. But one day maybe I'll make a special podcast about the now dismissed and disgraced governor of the Punjab, ex Mohammad Sarwar, ex-governor of the Punjab. 
Of course, the war drags on in the Ukraine, the American-Russian war, in which, as Peter Hitchens, that well-known Bolshevik, writing in that well-known communist newspaper, the Daily Mail, the Mail on Sunday, this very day, described as a U.S.-Russian war, with the Ukraine being used merely as a battering ram. It is a bloody and wholly unnecessary war, one which could have been avoided and right up until the last moment. It emerged today in Germany uh, that uh, Prime Minister Schultz of Germany begged the Ukrainian leader Zelensky to, are we allowed to say Zelensky, we've got to drop the Z, Elensky, Ulansky, Elensky, whatever you want to call him. Schultz begged him, make a statement that you will definitely be neutral, you will definitely never join NATO. And having taken advice in Washington, no doubt, Zelensky refused to do so. If he had done so, this bloody war could have been avoided entirely. As it is, it drags on. It will, of course, come to only one conclusion as everyone involved in cheering from the sidelines or demanding more weapons and more action, like the 101st Chairborne Division in television studios and editorial offices all over the world are doing. Everyone knows this war can only end one way, and that is in the acceptance of the minimal terms that Russia set out at the beginning, together with new terms that have become inescapable, ineluctable, because a war had to be fought to secure them. But I believe and hope that this war will come to a negotiated end and soon. But people are trying their best uh, to prolong it. I predicted last week to ribaldry from uh, some surprising quarters, uh, that the United States was planning a false flag event, either in the form of a chemical or biological weapon attack that never was or might have been actually as a provocation launched by their own friends, perhaps in the Nazi Azov battalion or some other kind of event, and it may very well be uh, that the other kind of event is what we are now seeing. In the town of Buka, in the Ukraine, we are seeing a well-coordinated, world globally coordinated attempt uh, to paint a picture of some ghastly, hideous war crime that has taken place there. I don't know for sure, of course, any more than you do, because this is a war in a country full of mobile phones and in a country packed full of journalists with surprisingly little war footage. But some footage has emerged that is intended to suggest that a war crime was committed by the Russian armed forces in the town of Buka. I don't believe it because I haven't seen any evidence to make me believe it but I have seen lots of evidence that suggests that it is indeed a false flag. Whether it's the corpses that wave their hand as the trucks go by, or the same corpse sitting up in the rear view mirror once the vehicle filming the situation had passed. I'm not making this up. You can find it easily on social media, on my Twitter feed, or because I'd already seen that very street, that very footage in which it was described as strewn with Russian soldiers' bodies when they were trying to suggest that Ukraine had counterattacked and liberated Buka rather than the truth that the Russians had withdrawn from it and the Ukrainian armed forces had then occupied it or because the mayor of Buka, when Russia withdrew, 
on the 30th of March, tweeted pictures of himself in the town saying that the Russians had gone and that the city was now liberated. Except he didn't make any mention at all of any atrocity, any war crime that had taken place there. I know of lots of other war crimes, and again, if I were to adumbrate them, it would take the rest of the show. But I'm not at liberty to do that, though you may very well uh, make calls and send messages to allow me to respond over the uh, course of the show. So I don't believe that Buka was a war crime. I believe it belongs in the long line of false flag operations used to trigger war from the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam in the 1960s, now absolutely revealed to have been a false flag operation, to the attack on the American warship, the Vincennes, in the uh, Mediterranean, to the false flag of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, to the false flag of uh, the Gaddafi forces being given Viagra and sent out to rape people in eastern Libya. I've heard too many of these uh, to believe them without evidence. But time will tell. One of the good things about the fact that a lot of clever people have not been fooled by all of this war propaganda is that they are well able to debunk the debunkable. We'll be talking uh, about the Ukraine-Russia war and we'll be talking about fake news in the course of the show with new guests, all of them with considerable followings on social media and all of them well qualified to add to the sum of human knowledge. There's the first poll. Is Pakistan's Prime Minister next for regime change? A yes, B no. It's simple. You can vote on my Twitter handle, Blue Tick, or you can vote on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe if you're watching on that, and you can vote on my Telegram channel, which is t.me forward slash George Galloway. I'll be back right after a one minute break. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dichotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. <laughs> Listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. There's the poll then. Is Pakistan's Prime Minister next for regime change? A, yes, B, no. Vote on Twitter, on YouTube, and on Telegram. And if you want to get your calls in now, we've got two lines and two family members operating them. Both of them very good at their jobs. So get your calls in now. 
If you're in the United Kingdom, remember, it's completely free to call the show. It's 08 081 That's 08 081 If you're in the United States or Canada, it's also toll free. Cost you nothing at all to call the show. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. Or you can email the show anytime at onair at moats.tv. Now one of the most maddening aspects of dealing with this war psychosis in Western countries, particularly the United States, Canada, and Great Britain, but also in Australia and in much, but not all, of what we might call the Anglosphere, is the absolute ignorance deliberately fostered of when this conflict started. The vast majority of people waving flags and putting up twibbons and digging deep and giving millions, actually hundreds of millions, uh, to the cause of Ukraine, believe that it started uh, five weeks ago. That's, when, that's what they think. They don't know that this war began in 2014, when Ukraine was set on fire by an American organized coup and EU organized coup, which literally set the Parliament House on fire, drove the president in fear of his life from his country. A coup which created such fear in the eastern part of the country uh, that they decided they could not, in fact, live under this coup regime buttressed as it was, perhaps even not buttressed, that would be from the outside, perhaps even having as its pillars the ultra-right and also Nazi formations that then moved to the line of control between West and East Ukraine and spent eight years murdering people, 14,000 people. Ukraine was on fire but nobody saw it because no media wanted you to know it. But the great Oliver Stone, of course, made a wonderful movie, which actually is very hard to find now, or at least it was until the makers of the film released it for free because the people who had commercial custody of it were deliberately suppressing it. And my first guest this evening, Igor Lopatonok, from the United States, from the west coast of the United States, is a filmmaker, producer, and director, and author of Ukraine on Fire and Revealing Ukraine. And if I'm lucky, he'll join us right now. Igor, uh, I'm very uh, happy that you could uh, join us. Um, deal with that. Last point of mine first, would you? Why do so many people imagine that war in the Ukraine began just over a month ago rather than eight long bloody years ago? Hi, George. Thank you for having me in your show. I'm very Welcome. pleased. Uh, this is a very important question because now when everybody feeling endangered by the action of military operation was happening in Ukraine, Everybody start paying attention to Ukraine because it will cause the harm to the viewer, to the audience. This is why I believe people now start reacting on our film and they start paying attention what the story was really revealed in 2014 in February when a bloody coup happened on the streets of Kiev and people were killed. You just talk about that Bucha uh, false flag operation, what uh, very professional, very skilled people, exactly the same people who run behind the white helmets in Syria, who run in Ukraine for these eight years unfolding in a in Ukrainian little town. They choose the name of this town because it's very similar to Butcher, because they know how to 
gain the traction how to squeeze an emotion from the Western audience. And they did it eight years ago when they staged false flag killing on the state of Kiev in front of cameras. They set up cameras and they killed 49 people live on the street of Kiev. This is how Ukrainian regime was run by eight years. Lie, fake, staged, false flag, and, and very skillful understanding how to target the audience, how to promote that narrative, and how to spread to the Western audience. This is why when our film was released, we got in 2016 not a very big traction on the West. We, we, big, we, we take a lot of audience in Russia, and in Ukraine, we have a 7 million views with Ukraine on Fire on YouTube in Ukraine. And we was continuously banned, banned, censored until, until now. And, to, and uh, after 24 February, when our film started gaining exponential interest from the audience, suddenly YouTube decided to delete us. And we fight back. They restore our film. But they restrict it to anyone who have no account on YouTube or younger than 18 years cannot watch it. We're still going pretty well with everywhere. We're in Apple, we're in Amazon, we're in YouTube, Rumble. Thanks, big thanks to Rumble who take us. We, we get the 2.7 million view just for the four weeks. And we start, we, we try to tell the truth about Ukrainian uh, crisis and analyze the roots as a filmmakers we have much more freedom than news we can go deep we can dive in the history we can dive in the years and the centuries of that conflict and for, for to understand it better people need just to watch the film and we also did the sequel for the ukraine on fire what's called revealing ukraine in 2019 and we also film another film in 2021 and we currently filming now because it's a crucial and important time. We're all in danger because of all of this. Yes, uh, I mean, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, as someone famously once said. And everyone now has a little knowledge of Ukraine. The problem is that that knowledge has come through a filter uh, to lead them only in one direction. Am I right? Yes, yes. Not only filter. They try to saturate the media with a polyphony of different aspects with same trend. So they, they push in same narration, but with a little, deep, little bit different uh, craft. And this is how they dominate the narration. And this is how they try to erase everyone who has an alternative vision, another side of story, who have different POV, different point of view, they very, very afraid of something else emerge because it can counterbalance and that can give to audience real perception what's going on, what is going on with, from this side and from that side. This is why we, the, I was an enemy of the state after my film in Ukraine uh, and my film was prohibited and they fired even granat launcher in 2019 uh, to the uh, building of TV station who have a plan to release our sequel for Ukraine on Fire. This is how they fight the truth. This is how the people, and don't make uh, any mistake, this is not Ukrainian people. That residents of these people in the state of Virginia and uh, close to Langley, this is where the people who instruct Ukrainians, who write the technology, who give them examples, who train them, and who amplified them. This is the place. And we also know the names of these people who are behind of this narration. There's a people like a Joel Harding, who was operating in Ukraine from 2014 and early, crafting the Maidan narration, uh, starting uh, through the Russophobic uh, uh, signs on the Maidan and pushing the narration in a way to alienate Ukrainians and to make them fight with Russians because this is how empire working, divide and conquer. You need to separate. It's like, you know, it's a myth about, not a myth, it's a, it's a uh, idea what Russians unbeatable on a battlefield. You can only beat Russians if you make them fight each other. This tactic and this strategy 
what they working on now. Now, uh, what did you discover about the extraordinarily close and personal uh, relationship of the Biden family uh, to all of this? This is something else that in any normal polity, in any normal media, would be a matter of very great importance. Everyone would know and everyone would be talking about, wait a minute, what did the Bidens have to do with Ukraine? They have no familial connection there. They're not uh, oil and gas people. Uh, you know, they're not even Texans. Uh, how did they end up in such a immensely profitable and highly suspicious relationship with the coup regime that emerged in 2014? But first of all, it all started with the uh, Obama uh, State Department officials, who is uh, Victoria Nuland, and it was a famous intercepted call when she called Jeffrey Pyatt, ambassador of the United States in Ukraine, and they openly discuss whom to position as the next prime minister of Ukraine. So they're talking about coup. Great, amazing American journalist, Robert Perry explained that part of the story for Ukraine on fire. After that, and in the very end of uh, this conversation, after famous quote from the EU, EU, European Union, this is how Victoria Nuland uh, think about Europe, uh, they agreed what's the time to talk to Sullivan, who is now national security advisor in the White House, and to dispatch the Biden. So Biden practically was not in the position of understanding where he's going. The, Victoria Nuland, who is a lieutenant of Hillary Clinton, who is like uh, the student of Dick Cheney, famous neoconservative who ran the war in Iraq. And by the way, Victoria Nuland, don't forget, she was behind that famous think tank, APAC, who crafted Iraq war for the Dick Cheney uh, the, the, uh, administration. This, that was a master of these puppets. And uh, after that, Biden, who started visiting Ukraine very often, he was like a 14 times for the few years, and make a friendship with a crooked Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko, who is an oligarch who was exposed in Panama case with, with his, his numerous offshore accounts, they start making uh, some kind of business. And business was, first of all, first of all about oil, because Hunter Biden find the lucrative position and the and company called Burisma. And that company was in, under investigation. And they arranged that membership in a, in a, in a board of Burisma by people like Hunter Biden and uh, David Archer, just because they want to protect their assets. They want to show, like, listen, we have a son of the vice president in our board. Please uh, get lost. But Ukrainian prosecutors started investigating the deeper and deeper until the time when, when President Poroshenko was called by President Biden and President, Vice President Biden demand to fire that prosecutor immediately, 24 hours, or the Biden will uh, put on hold $1 billion of credit, what was approved already for Ukraine. Poroshenko tried to, like you know, to stand and say, this is not you who approve it, this is Obama did. And what they, they Biden tell him, call him. So this is a hypocrisy, and this is actually, I don't think it's an extortion or if it's a, some criminal act, but this is not legal. And prosecutors... Well, it's fired. certainly, uh, e even yeah. by American and and standards, and, and, it's, uh, it's not legal. Yeah. And investigation was stopped, and the hunter was uh, happy to continue uh, his uh, little business in Ukraine. It's, it's not a very big, few millions. But as we know now, no. Hunter was involved also in the funding of biolabs. Hunter was behind that biolabs in Ukraine, helping them to arrange 
the funding for microbiota, our uh, California uh, bio startup located in the yeah. in the valley, and uh, and his over overall his footprints everywhere, <laughs> his footprints everywhere in Ukraine. Unbelievable. And this is Unbelievable. this is, yeah. And they say this that Trump was going. a crook. Igor, thank you very oh, much yeah. for uh, that glimpse, and I encourage everyone to see your film, Ukraine on Fire and Revealing Ukraine. Best of luck with the work that you're doing now. Igor, thank you very much for joining us. Here's my first question of the evening. It's a good one. This is the week in 1968 when the US civil rights leader Martin Luther King was assassinated by James Earl Ray. Where did it happen? A, Los Angeles, B, Dallas, C, Memphis. Answer right after this. Peter says the Afghan people have lost, George. I thought you were better than this, to be honest. Give me a call, Peter, tell me what you mean. And Oliver says, for some reason, George was on the jihadist side when it came to Yugoslavia. And that's the reason I will never trust him. I fought against the war on Yugoslavia with all my breath and all my heart. Me and Tony Benn and Jeremy Corbyn and others were practically the only people in this country opposing the war on Yugoslavia, the destruction of Yugoslavia. How dare you, you imbecile? If you have any guts, you'll pick up the phone right now and call this show and justify that utter slander. Really. And uh, Yoda says, love the show, best entertainment and education on the airwaves. <laughs>
You have to put your money where your mouth is. However small, donate. You have to donate or we could lose this show as we lost the mother of all talk shows extra. I don't like having to ask, so don't make me beg, because I won't. We'll just have to raise this money or we'll have to shut the show. I can't put it any more clearly than that. Now, my next guest is Maxim Suchkov. He's a Moscow-based policy expert at the Russian International Affairs Council and in the past a visiting fellow at Georgetown University in Washington DC and New York University, a considerable intellectual and academic. And I wanted to talk to him about the economic side of things, the great changes that have been provoked by the Russian intervention in Ukraine and the Western reaction to it. The tectonic plates have shifted. Quite clearly, right in front of our eyes, you can almost hear them do so. You can watch them do so at the petrol pumps. Watch them do so at the, uh, at the till in the supermarket. Aldi are <laughs> increasing their prices between 20 and 50 percent in Germany next week. Just think about that. Maxim uh, joins me now, I hope. Yes, Maxim, thank you very much for doing so. Um, I'm right, Amantai, that in a way, the, the long-term, maybe even medium-term significance of these events is not really on the battlefield, but on the dramatic changes on the financial and economic uh, fronts that have been uh, provoked. Well, indeed, thanks for having me uh, in the first place. And secondly, I totally agree with your assessment that the tectonic changes that we're now foreseeing, and actually uh, there will be more of that uh, perhaps in, in the coming um, weeks and months, uh, are happening not necessarily in the battlefield, but in other domains. Uh, the immediate you know, fallout of, of the conflict. Uh, obviously, we've, we've seen this uh, price hike in, in, in oil and gas, but also some of the things such as, the, you know, the sanctions uh, uh, on the Russian fertilizers affecting agricultural productions uh, and will very much echo as far as, as the assessments go in, in, the, in the autumn, perhaps, uh, as Russia and Ukraine are both major uh, grain uh, exporters to Africa and the Middle East and other countries, but also in a lot of uh, states in the United States that uh, traditionally produce uh, wheats and grain, there hasn't been uh, rain since uh, last autumn. So the the you know the production is expected to be very low, which will further affect uh, the agricultural uh, market. Uh, in other things, you know, uh, we've, we've come to see this uh, kind of uh, phrase that Russia is, is a gas station with, with missiles. And uh, the, the, the truth of the matter is that a lot of the commodities uh, that Russia is involved in the production of, say, uh, microchips and, and the semiconductors, uh, some of the rare earth metals produced in Russia, are now not coming to the market, which will also affect that domain. A lot of things that are extremely important to the modern development of the world are now halted and will have a long-term effect. And that's before we turn to the currency issues, which we will. But let me ask you something. If it's true, and I think many now see it, uh, that, uh, that the United States is using Ukraine as a battering ram, as a cat's paw, against Russia. It's also true that the United States is using Europe uh, as a battering ram, as a cat's paw, because they have insisted on such draconian sanctions in Europe uh, that the European economies are now in very serious danger. Um, a New York Times writer put it this way the other day, Europeans are going to have to get used to being hungrier and colder 
over the next few years. Nobody asked us, by the way, if we wanted to be hungrier and colder. Uh, it was the orders from Washington that we uh, do so. And this is causing great problems, obviously, first and foremost in Germany, but uh, in other countries, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and so on, Hungary, uh, they simply can't do without Russian gas. But here's my point. At the same time, in the last month, the United States itself has increased its purchases of Russian oil by 43% to 100,000 barrels a day. And you mentioned fertilizers, has lifted the sanctions on yes. fertilizers because the farm vote in the United States is going to be very important at the midterms in November. So the U.S. itself is not involved in the sanctions, that it is demanding that European countries, they're ready to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood and ready to fight to the last drop uh, of European economic activity, it seems. Well, there's, uh, that's absolutely right, and I would also uh, say that there isn't really anything new about this pattern of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, the United States are, you know, most of the time are not actually waging any wars without finding an extra source of financing uh, for that. So in this particular conflict, indeed, I think Europe, uh, Ukraine and Russia are the ultimate losers, uh, Ukraine for different reasons, and, and uh, Europe will uh, will be dependent on the U.S. for on a number of things for, for decades to come. Uh, China, in my view, is also one of the possible winners of, of this conflict, uh, as they will also increase their you know, influence over uh, Russian market, and Russia will indeed uh, perhaps most probably increase its own dependency on China. So that will be uh, very unfortunate, uh, I think. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, we are, we're coming to this uh, new duopo duopoly, digital duopoly, uh, where, you know, the, the digital power of UAC, uh, big tech and, and Chinese big tech will, will dominate uh, Europe. And uh, we'll see if, if it's true for, for Russia as well. But that seems to be the, the shaping pattern for now. Now, on the currency, I mean, just en passant, uh, is Joe Biden paying in rubles for the 100,000 barrels a day? <laughs> is he paying in rubles uh, for the fertilizer? Do you, do you know? I have no idea. I think uh, they're, they're not. The, the issue uh, was only for the gas. Uh, I don't think fertilizers were, were, were affected by, uh, by this uh, counter move on, on part of Russia. And the scheme itself is very tricky. Uh, though, so the basically, to, to put it uh, simply, the countries have to uh, now, uh, you know, the, the European uh, countries uh, have to uh, purchase uh, open, actually, first and foremost, a, a bank account at Gazprom Bank. This is one of the few uh, banks out there that were not affected by Western sanctions. And uh, some specialists in, in Russia think that this move on the part of the Russian government to secure the payment for gas in, in rubles is mostly uh, to secure uh, Gazprom Bank from further sanctions to keep, you know, Gazprom Bank as, as the, the, the biggest uh, bank out there, that out, out of sanctions. Uh, but the scheme itself is very tricky, so they have to open uh, an account in the Gazprom Bank. Uh, they have to transfer their money, uh, Euro dollars, to the Gazprom Bank. Then Gazprom Bank will have to trade them in, in the stocks and exchange them into rubles and then transfer it to uh, you know uh, Gazprom company too, so it's it's a little complicated. So they're not entirely uh, entitled to purchase rubles per se, uh, but that makes uh, the payment go further to de-dollarize the global economy in a sense. And that de-dollarization, in a way, is the big enchilada. Uh, by the way, I, I read earlier today that Peskov had said that uh, the ruble requirement to buy gas uh, will now, uh, next week, be applied to all Russian exports. Mm -hmm. So it would, uh, if it comes to pass, mean that Joe Biden, if he wants the fertilizer, and he clearly does, or he wouldn't have lifted the sanctions on it, 
uh, will have to pay in rubles. Wouldn't that be ironic? But this de-dollarization uh, issue is the big enchilada, isn't it? It ends the uh, stranglehold uh, that the United States has had on uh, international commerce, on the banking sector. It uh, ends the monopoly of the SWIFT system and so on. In a way, that will be the longest lasting consequence of the events in Ukraine, won't it? Right. I have to note to, for, uh, to our listeners that uh, since the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russia's plan A was not to destroy the West, as many argue. It was to fit into the new uh, Western system on quote-unquote equal footing. And, 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 and uh, the Russia's concern was that it was never ever seen as a quote-unquote equal partner. So then uh, the plan B, obviously, since Putin's uh, Munich speech in 2007, was to w weaken uh, the dependency of the world on the United States, to de-Americanize the international system per se, and de-dollarization was part of that, of course. Now we are kind of moving uh, at, at, a, at a much faster speed at these policies, but not because Russia is so powerful, Russia is doing something, but it's most, most obviously because the West is doing something to shoot itself in the foot with its own policies. Uh, you know, you, you've seen uh, the United States freezing and seizing uh, Russian uh, assets and uh, gold, uh, you know, foreign assets. Uh, which tremendously weakens the trust in the U.S. You know policies for other countries. You know it seizes the properties of the Russian uh, oligarchs, which actually is doing uh, Russia, I think, in the long term a big favor. Uh, you know, back in the day, Putin traveled to the U.K. in 2002 to ask the British government to you know ban all the oligarchs and seize their property. It took 22 years to, for the British government to do so, <laughs> and I think you know it, it actually does a lot of favor to the Russian uh, people in the first place, uh, but, uh, you know, ultimately it weakens the trust in the Western institutions, in the Western banking system for other countries that are now investing in the West. And that is something that I think weakens the West in the long run. Uh, and that is a major takeout from this conflict so far. Maxim, thank you very much indeed for joining us at this late hour, Moscow time. Thank you very much for being on the mother of all talk shows. Is Pakistan's prime minister next for regime change? A pretty overwhelming number of you say, I'm afraid so. Yes, 74 on Twitter. Yes, 74 on YouTube. Yes, 80% on Telegram. Now, of course, the second hour beckons after the news. Uh, and coming up in the next hour, We've got somebody quite remarkable. She's an internet sensation, well over 100,000 followers. Ivory Hecker is the Fox News reporter who called out her company's corruption live on air. She's now an independent journalist focusing on corporate corruption and media censorship. Now, this is, of course, an extremely important subject. She's an extremely brave lady because we've grown used to the fallacy that our news is real news and other people's news is state-sponsored or is uh, uh, mandated or, or all the canards that you have heard. The truth is our media, our news is corrupt to the core and don't think that Fox News is the worst of it. Anyway, I'll be back after the news with Elliot King. I'm going to have a glass of my tea.
Pakistan's president has dissolved parliament, a step towards early elections following an attempt to remove Prime Minister Imran Khan from office. It comes after parliament's deputy speaker refused to hold a vote of no confidence that Khan was expected to lose. Khan claims the United States is leading a conspiracy to remove him because of his criticism of US policy and other foreign policy decisions he has taken. Opposition politicians have ridiculed the allegation and the US has denied this. Khan has also been critical of America's war on terror. Khan visited Moscow to meet President Vladimir Putin as Russia was launching the invasion of Ukraine. The Prime Minister is widely believed to have come to power with the help of Pakistan's army, but now observers say they have fallen out. His political opponents seized the opportunity to demand the no-confidence vote after persuading a number of his coalition partners to defect to them. On Sunday, Information Minister Fawad Shundri told MPs that Pakistani officials had told of an operation for a regime change by a foreign government. This, he said, went against the constitution and the deputy speaker chairing the session, a close ally of the prime minister, proceeded to declare the vote unconstitutional. The opposition had now filled a petition to the country's Supreme Court, which is assessing whether the decision not allow a vote of no confidence against the prime minister is valid. At least six people have been killed and ten injured in a shooting in the centre of Sacramento, police in California's state capital say. People fled through the streets after rapid gunfire rang out in an area packed with restaurants and bars in the early hours of today. No suspect is yet in custody in the wake of the shootings. They took place around 2am in, in an area at 10th Street in K, a few streets from the state capitol building. Britain's Transport Secretary has said energy will not be rationed in the UK despite pressures on supplies globally. Grant Sharps ruled this out after Labour's shadow business secretary suggested ministers might need to prepare for rationing. Some European countries have moved towards rationing as energy costs rise and supplies tighten. Sharps said the energy strategy would be announced later this week. Plans to expand nuclear and wind power are expected to form part of the strategy, which has been delayed amid cost concerns. Conservative MP David Warburton has told friends that he has been admitted to a psychiatric hospital after allegations about his behaviour were made in a Sunday newspaper. The MP has said that he's being treated for severe shock and stress, adding, this has been sheer hell. The Somerton and From MP has had his Tory whip withdrawn pending an investigation into allegations about his conduct, which are being examined by Parliament's Independent Complaints and Grievances Scheme. Prince Andrew returned from the Falklands War a changed man, he said in a now-deleted piece posted on his ex-wife's Instagram account. The Duke of York recalled his time as a helicopter pilot in the conflict 40 years ago in three posts on Saturday, and only hours later, all posts were removed. It is unclear why the 700-word account was taken down. Andrew gave up the right to use His Royal Highness in an official capacity in January. This was when the Queen stripped her son of his honorary military roles as he faced a US civil action over sexual assault allegations, which he denied. Virginia Gough sued Andrew for allegedly sexually assaulting her on three occasions when she was 17. The case later reached a multi-million pound settlement out of court. The official telegram channel of the Russian Defence Ministry has shared a claim that reports of civilian deaths in the UK town of Buka are fake. Videos from the city, which was recently retaken by Ukrainian forces, appear to show civilians lying dead in the street. Some of them apparently with their hands tied have shocked the world. The reposted report claims that Russian forces left the city on the 30th of March. Where have these pictures been for four days? The fact that they were absent only confirms that this is fake, he quoted. The Russian Defence Ministry have not commented officially on the situation in Buka. The report mentioned above was reposted by the ministry. The post then claimed that after Russian forces left Buka, the Ukrainian armed forces subjected the city to artillery strikes, which also could have led to civilian deaths. A mass grave found in the city, it says, was created by the Ukrainians. The Taliban announced today a ban on the cultivation of narcotics in Afghanistan, the world's biggest opium producer. In a statement it said, if anyone violates the decree, the crop will be destroyed immediately and the violator will be treated according to the Shari law. The order announced at a news conference by the Ministry of Interior in Kabul said, the order said the production, use or transportation of other narcotics was also banned. 
drug control has been one major demand of the international community of the Islamic group, which took charge of the country in August and is seeking formal international recognition in order to wind back sanctions that are severely hampering banking, business and development. And finally, US airline Alaska has announced that it has launched new gender neutral uniform guidelines for flight attendants. The airline said it would also collaborate with a designer to develop gender neutral uniform items for frontline employees, such as flight attendants, customer service agents and uniformed lounge employees. The announcement comes after a 2021 allegation by an Alaska Airlines employee that the airline's uniforms policy discriminated against employees whose gender expression does not fit the male and female dress codes, particularly non-binary employees, those whose gender identity falls out of the binary of male or female. The previous policy required flight attendants to wear either male or female uniforms. The airline also regulated other aspects of dress like hairstyle, makeup and jewellery based on the worker's assumed gender. The company has also created personal pronoun pins that employees can choose to wear with their uniforms. That's all your news for now. I'm Elliot King. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. Now, keep your donations coming in, please, if we're going to keep this show going. There's a brand new feature, by the way. You can now use Super Chat on the YouTube stream. It's just been activated, and you can donate now using Super Chat. Head over to YouTube if you aren't already watching me on it now and hit the button. Search YouTube George Galloway Official to find me. It's very, very important uh, that if we're going to keep this global university alive, that you donate what you can. If you don't donate, you can still watch. Uh, we're not going behind a paywall. We're trusting you to, if you value this show, to give what you can to keep it alive. Now, my next guest is one of my personal heroes. Ivory Hecker was the Fox News reporter who called out her company's corruption live on air. She's now an independent journalist focusing on topics like the corporate news censors. Because as I said before the news, don't make the mistake of thinking Fox News is the only bad apple or even the most rotten apple in the basket. It isn't. And I never thought I'd find myself saying that. Let's talk with Ivory now, who is on the line. Ivory, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. I, I metaphorically take my hat off to you. You're a very brave uh, and capable woman and doing a great job. But for those that didn't, as I have, uh, see what you did and know why you did it, kindly bring this global audience up to speed. What happened? Well, thank you so much for the kind words, George. It's good to be on with you. Um, yeah, it was last summer that I was scheduled to go live on location for Fox. Um, and instead, I just told them that told the audience that Fox has been muzzling me to keep certain information from them and that I would be releasing some tapes of what goes on behind the scenes at Fox because it applies to the viewers. I had, I had discovered how corrupt they were the, uh, starting 10 months prior to that, and I had been trying to figure out how to leave this corrupt company because it didn't sit with my conscience to have them control the narrative and force me to be a tool of the narrative. And so I finally realized that the easiest way to get away from them was just to call out the truth about them live on air. So that's what I did. Well, you, you did it with such aplomb and courage uh, that uh, if there was a, a Nobel Prize for these kind of things, you'd be definitely in the running for it. How did they react? How long did you get on air before they pulled the plug on you? They actually didn't pull the plug the entire time. I was shocked. Um, I'm not sure if the control room just didn't know what to do or wasn't paying attention. 
But I, I called them out and then I continued to go along with what I was reporting on on the ground there. And then I tossed to some recorded sound bites and then it came back to me and I was shocked that, that the control room sent it back to me. Maybe they were on my side. Maybe they were sick of the corruption too. <laughs> and said, so let's put it back on Ivory. But uh, I, it took it took like an hour to finally get called by my boss and ask what was going on. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, uh, many of us have watched the uh, wonderful movie uh, about uh, Fox News, and we're familiar with the uh, Himalaya of sexual allegations against uh, top people uh, at the channel. Um, and uh, and the, the Fox is not alone in that, of course. That's, uh, as the Me Too thing showed, common throughout the entertainment industry in the United States and no doubt elsewhere uh, too. Uh, but that's not what you were calling out, was it? You were calling out corruption in general. Right. I, I had never been victim to the sexual stuff, thankfully, but I found myself being forced by my bosses to parrot a certain narrative that was contrary to what I was collecting on the ground. Um, and it stuck out to me that that was happening in summer of 2020, uh, most notably when I was sent to cover a COVID ward. And, uh, you know, Fox sent me there. They, they assigned me to that. I didn't pick that doctor or that ward. I wasn't trying to create my own narrative, but Fox thought that this unit would that what this doctor would doing would would comply with their narrative, the, the international narrative. And it did not. In fact, this doctor, his death rate at the hospital was remarkably lower. At the same time, he was using drugs that the narrative said were bad for you, that didn't work, were bad for you. And uh, the fact that I allowed his recipe of what he was using to get out to the viewers um, it all hell broke loose in my newsroom and, and Fox came from my throat, threatened to fire me, made up lies about me, uh, all because I allowed what this doctor was using that worked apparently. His death rate was like a third or a quarter the, the rate of other hospitals. Uh, but, you know, so that's when I realized, wow, all I did is what I've always done go out on the scene, collect what's really happening, and let the viewers know. But this time, I'm not allowed to do that. And then I, and then I just continued to see more and more of that corruption when it come to, came to the narrative about the election, when it came to the narrative about vaccines. And I realized I've got to get out of this. I can't be a tool of their narrative anymore. And I just need the viewers to know how much the on-air talent is controlled. Yeah, and since when it's got worse, of course. The, we've now moved into uh, Superdrive. Uh, this is turbocharged. Uh, if you have uh, the temerity to tell the truth as you see it or to expose facts that are not uh, easily fittable within the uh, prevailing orthodoxy, uh, you'll simply be closed down. I mean, even the president of the United States was put off social media. Uh, so we, uh, we have a situation now where most people think, I think they do still think, uh, that we have a free press. You've even got a, a, a constitutional amendment that supposedly guarantees it. But in truth, it's never been less free. A hundred percent. It's an incredibly concerning what we've seen happen to our free press, especially since the pandemic hit. Uh, but yeah, our, our First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says Congress shall make no law that limits the free speech. But what we're seeing is people go around the lawmaking. And, you know, what we have is an oligarchy of these uh, big media corporations that are collaborating to shut down our speech uh, anyways. And fortunately, you can still create 
your own news outlet on the, uh, away from those corporations, which I've, I've now done. I now went independent and am able to cover some of the things that the corporate news won't touch, some of the things that YouTube and Facebook will censor out. But it, it's incredibly difficult to have a successful media business with all of the censorship surrounding. A lot of people, they get their, their news, they, they push their news out on places like Facebook. It's like, hey, I just wrote this article, post the link on Facebook. An independent journalist can't do that anymore because Facebook will delete that link if it goes against the narrative. So it's we're in a strange, very concerning time. In fact, I, I created a, an uncensorable website, ivoryhecker.com, on, on its own server. And that server has been victim of countless attacks trying to destroy the server, which hosts not only my independent journalism site, but several other independent journalists. So something is happening where independent journalism is being come after from all different sides. And one of the most alarming things about this is the silence of the corporate media journalists. These people who went to journalism school who thought uh, we all thought that they were in it for the right reasons, that they were in it for the free, to, free speech, free press, which fortifies the freedom of the people. Um, and suddenly we're seeing free speech under assault from every direction. And these people are absolutely silent and complicit. It's quite chilling. Well, uh, yeah, the discovery is that they were not in it for the reasons they claimed to be in it. It was to... In Sting's famous words, it's money for nothing and your chicks for free. Uh, that's why they were in the media. And as long as that keeps coming, uh, then the truth can go hang itself. A, a classic example, and I know that you've written about this, is Julian Assange, the world-famous political prisoner uh, in London, in a dungeon, uh, facing... 175 years in an American dungeon if he is uh, deported. And all he did was uncover uncomfortable truths. And the criminals on whom he reported have made it a crime to report on their crimes. And so you're attacked from the uh, point of view of, uh, of, of commercial uh, point of view, uh, the commercial front, but you're also attacked in, uh, in, the, in extremists if your work is successful enough with the threat of actual criminalization and imprisonment. It's really disheartening to see. And, and you know, the more Americans become aware of, of Julian Assange's case and realize that, oh, that's our government that we, we always thought our government loved freedom. Why are why is our government after Julian Assange like this? Um, it's it's pretty concerning. Um, but you know, I think I think that they're making an example of him to scare away other people from un uncovering government secrets. And I think a lot of these media corporations are so controlled. Um, they're so in lockstep together with their narratives and things because they are afraid of government or or any special interests coming after them or turning away from them. Um, I I know that when I, one of the first concerning things for me with Fox was when we saw social media, Facebook, Twitter, begin to censor people at a highly escalated rate in 2020. I called it right out. This is something China has been doing to its people for a long time to control the press. And I said, hey, our, our freedom of speech is looking a whole lot more like China. Out of nowhere, I, I publicly called it out summer of 2020 and Fox came after me. I had multiple HR calls telling me what a huge mistake I had made to pick a side on, on this censorship debate. And I said, excuse me, the one thing the press should always be biased about is free speech. If we are a free press, we, we can't be a free press without having free speech. So we need to stand up for this. I was dumbfounded that Fox took the side of silence. And if you don't stay silent on censorship, you are disciplined and you may get fired. That's part of why I left Fox as well. 
we can't have democracy if we don't have free speech. Uh, it, you might as well just dispense with democracy if you cannot have the free play of ideas, the clash uh, of perspectives. If you cannot be free to argue your point of view, then you don't have a democracy. You're just a different kind of dictatorship. Exactly. And it went, when it comes to collecting facts as journalists, which was supposed to be my job back then, uh, if you live in a society that supports censorship, then there will be dark areas where the free press is not allowed to go. You're not allowed to go discover what might be over here because this is the censored area. And therefore, it's not a free press. We, we can't because we can't truly get to the truth if we don't see the whole field of what's really going on. Uh, so the fact that Fox turned that way, and, and amongst Americans, Americans thought that Fox was the one outlet that was different. They knew how pretty corrupt the rest of our media was, uh, uh, anti-freedom the rest of our media was. They thought that Fox was different. Fox has started to show its concerning colors in these past few years, and that's why I left, that's why Lara Logan uh, just parted ways with Fox in December. Um, it's, it's concerning what's happening. Tell us again, please, how people can follow you and, and see what you're producing. Yeah, uh, I actually have a YouTube channel. You can search Ivory Hecker on YouTube for, for my news, um, as well as ivoryhecker.com or watch.ivoryhacker.com. That's my uncensored video website where I cover everything that YouTube doesn't allow. Fantastic. You're a star. Thanks for joining us. I hope we have you back sometime soon. Thank you, Ivory Hacker. Now, my next question uh, is, the lead singer of the rock band Nirvana shot himself this week in 1994. His drummer went on to form and be lead singer of another successful band. What was his name? Dave Grohl, Taylor Hawkins, or Mick Fleetwood? Answer after a two-minute break. You have to remember back in 2002, 2003, there was a wish by George Bush for regime change. That's what was driving him. Nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, which of course didn't exist in Iraq. So they had to construct some sort of formula, some sort of cover story, in order to persuade the British public that intervention in Iraq was right. Now David Kelly, uh, as an expert in weapons of mass destruction, knew that uh, this was untrue. He knew that there were probably no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was a guy that could have brought down, that was a guy that could have brought down the whole system. I reckon you're chaff. You've been thrown up to divert uh, our probing. The Foreign Affairs Select Committee, that um, parliamentarian briefing, I think that was an indignity to him. We saw it on the news, and my very first thought was shock. Um, oh, my God, you know, this man is in the eye of the media hurricane. Uh, he should be protected by that, at least. Well, I know your hands, Prime Minister. Are you going to resign over this? I don't know the details of how Lord Hutton happened to be selected, but what was certainly the case is that he was the right kind of judge to use from the point of view of Dining Street and the intelligence services as well. Of the 21 days of hearing, only one half of one day was spent on discussing the forensic aspects. That is disgusting. We were given the Hutton report the day before it was published, but actually what happened was he went too far. The events of 2003 were disgraceful ones in this country's history and it's unfinished business. Those responsible for an illegal war, those responsible for the death of David Kelly, have not been brought to justice. There's no, been no inquest into David Kelly's death. There needs to be one. We need to make sure that those who behaved in a reprehensible way in 2003 are finally brought to book. Dave Grohl, of course, is the answer. He went on to front the Foo Fighters. 
who re-emerged in the Jeremy Corbyn affair. Do you remember? Somebody got expelled out of the Labour Party for tweeting, I love the effing Foo Fighters. I've never quite understood that one. Uh, now, you just saw the Killing Kelly trailer there. A big thanks to everyone who came to see the film and me uh, in Liverpool on Monday. It was a packed house, sold out a month before the event. And thanks to Hope Street Theatre, it was highly successful. But you can still get tickets for the next one, which is Monday the 25th of April at 7 p.m. in the Oxford Town Hall. There's the ticketsource.co.uk forward slash killing Kelly. Let's uh, get some calls uh, on the board. Uh, Emma in Watford wants to talk about Pakistan. Emma, welcome to the show. Hi, George. Um, just before, I've got two points to make on Pakistan, but just before I do, Killing Kelly, amazing movie. I really enjoyed watching it. I thought I knew everything about the killing of Dr. David Kelly, but that movie really opened my eyes. So well done. Congratulations Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Emma. Thanks. So, so two things on Pakistan. Firstly, Chaudhary Sarwar, you've been warning about him for at least seven or eight years. And I think that, I mean, you've my tweet, been proven. My, my, my tweet <laughs> re-emerged today. It did, I it did, I saw in it. in 2015 to Imran Khan, do not trust this man. You will have many causes to regret if you team up with him. My goodness, how vindicated I felt this morning. Sorry, Emma, you've go been, on. No, no, you've been warning about him for a long time. But also, I think that yeah. he, is a, he is a huge, you know, he, he's a traitor. He could not be trusted. But also, the Punjab, I think that while you might have broken the back of Bradbury politics when you won with a landslide majority in Bradford West, I think the Punjab in um, Pakistan is very much about Bradbury politics. And this is how people like Chaudhary Sarwar feast on that. And um, that's the first point I wanted to make. But the second thing is, everything you said earlier in your introduction about Imran Khan, the assassination attempts, how this has happened, the foreign kind of interference of regime change, 100% I agree with it. But what astounds me is the naivety. I've been speaking to a lot of Pakistani um, people from Pakistan itself today. And it astounds me the naivety that they have, because they believe that the army is protecting Imran Khan, despite the statement made by um, General Bajwa over the last day or so. They feel that, you know, there's this is patriotism about the army, that they can't criticize it, and everything's going to be okay, and there's no assassination attempt. It's not that easy to do. And then you give them examples of things that have happened in Pakistan, and they just refute that. They feel that this is OK, Imran Khan's going to win. And, and this kind of attempt I have at waking them up to say, OK, it's good to be optimistic, but let's be realistic here as well as to what he's up against and what's happening here. There's no guarantees what the Supreme Court's going to decide. And then, you know, three months is a long time. He has to bring out a budget in that time. I think it's 4th or 5th of June his budget is due. Um, and there's a lot that could go wrong here in, in terms of his personal security has to be stepped up. And they're like, no, it's fine. We can walk right up to his home at the moment and it's fine there's no need for this so i don't know what's happening with the people of pakistan but i think they need to wake up and smell the coffee pretty quickly as to what's at stake well, here. Uh, yeah uh, uh, it's absolutely correct what you say uh, it, it, the army will protect the prime minister right up until they don't and uh, the moment that they don't uh, he will either be uh, overthrown by the army I mean, how many times has the Pakistan army overthrown the elected leadership of the country? How many periods? Pakistan has had half of its lifetime uh, under military dictatorship. So uh, this uh, rose-petaled view uh, of uh, the Pakistan army is wholly misplaced. Uh, and the uh, reality is that the top brass of the Pakistan army is a creature of the United States of America. And that's why the chief of army staff, General Bajwa, that you just referred to, flatly contradicted the prime minister's view on current international events, uh, sanctions, 
the European Union, the United States, he flatly contradicted the Prime Minister, the elected Prime Minister. Imagine in Britain if the elected Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, said this, this and this, the chief of the British Army flatly contradicting him in public uh, the very next day. Imran Khan said to the European Union, what are we, your slaves? You're going to order us with whom we can do business, referring to the oil and the wheat that they are buying uh, at a very good price from Russia. And uh, the general flatly contradicted it, talked about how vital it was uh, to keep good relations with the US and the EU and so on. The truth is, Pakistan's best interests lie not with the United States, but with China, which has stood with Pakistan in dark days and fine through every grim year of even military dictatorship. They have never interfered in Pakistan's internal affairs. They have been an absolutely loyal friend to Pakistan. That's where your future lies, people of Pakistan, not with uh, some joker called Joe Biden in Washington. Emma, thanks for that great call. Melvin is in New York. Welcome back, Melvin. Yes. Uh, hello, George. Um, two things. The two things. Um, first, you are familiar, I'm sure, with Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Raytheon, our war manufacturers yep. here in the United States, and I'm sure you have some in your area. Yes, I believe if we, do, we yeah. want it, I believe Although, if we unlike want the actually, American Congress, I own no stock in any of those companies. Although a very large number of members of your government do. I, I, I understand, and that's actually the point I was going to get to. Uh, I believe that we need to, and I don't know how to do it. That's why I'm calling for your advice. Uh, how we get people together to actually stop, you know, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Racy, all those people from actually making money off of this war. You know, I, I don't know how to do that. Maybe you have some advice on that. And the other thing, the second thing is, I actually have some friends in Ukraine, okay? I've been talking to them. Uh, and they're not on the, the, the side, the, the Donbass or that. They're on the other side. So they're, they're European-speaking Ukrainians. And they actually have stated to me completely different what the American media shows. Um, and they're actually afraid for their lives of actually coming on to, like, my YouTube channel or, or anything on, my, on social media anywhere and actually speaking the truth. It is something I figured I would get out there. Well, I'm glad you did, and it's absolutely true. Uh, all of the people of eastern Ukraine uh, want nothing to do with the coup regime in Kiev. But what is less well understood is that at least half of the people of Western Ukraine absolutely deplore the way that their country is being used and abused uh, as a tool of American policy, uh, implemented through a comedian who's now the richest comedian on the entire earth. Go figure. Melvin, I wish I knew the answer to your first question, uh, but I don't. Uh, you get the politicians you deserve. Uh, your country and mine uh, are ruled by a people who are part of a corrupt nexus whereby everything in the economy and indeed in the wider society is engineered in a way that a very small number of us can profit mightily uh, from the arrangements made, uh, and the rest of us just tread the hamster wheel, uh, earning just enough to stay alive, to get back on the hamster wheel uh, tomorrow, unless we're very unlucky and we go lame, metaphorically speaking, and are no longer of any use, and then we might as well starve or freeze as this coming winter uh, will may show uh, to death. So uh, the answer to your question is we have to change that system. We have to change those politicians. And if we don't, 
we'll be on that hamster wheel until we fall off it. Samuel's in Manchester, in England. Go ahead, Samuel. Hello, George. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. Um, Welcome, sir. Welcome. Two kind of unrelated questions, two somewhat related quick questions. Um, first of all, you obviously see a lot of dark things and a lot of disturbing things, and you know the consequences of those things and how they affect people. How do you live with that darkness you see? And, and, and also, kind of related to that, um, many years ago, after your testimony to the US Senate, you went on a programme hosted by Alex Jones of InfoWars. Alex Jones at the time was very critical of the US, the UK, and our allies' foreign policy in the Middle East. He was very critical of our respective governments on domestic issues as well. And though he had his eccentricities, he was a serious commentator and broadcaster. He's now a lunatic who goes on about child sex colonies on Mars and does all this race-baiting, pandering to the alt-right. Do you have any idea how Alex Jones went so weird? No, I've never met him. I've only been on his show uh, once, as you say, some years ago. Uh, but I agree with your assessment. Uh, I've no idea whether it is uh, trauma of some kind uh, or something worse uh, than that, but uh, uh, definitely I wouldn't go on his show uh, now. Uh, but, of course, I was also on the BBC many times, and I'm not oh, yeah. responsible for the crimes of the BBC, uh, and I'm not responsible, obviously, for Alec Jones's uh, uh, trips to Mars. I'm not saying uh, you are, George. I, I, no. no, I know. I know, you, I know you're not. Uh, I just want to make that clear to the wider audience. Uh, as to darkness, uh, I have light in my heart, in my mind. I have faith. Uh, I believe in God. I believe in humanity. I believe that God created humanity and that good and bad if you like, God and the devil are present in every one of us. And that life is a struggle uh, between good and evil. Uh, and that's true also of ourselves. We all are capable of terrible things, and we are also capable of good things. I believe that conscience is your daily communion with God. You have a conscience for a reason. Uh, nobody else has got a conscience. A tiger doesn't have a conscience. A gorilla doesn't have a conscience, but we do. And that conscience tells us when we're doing the right thing and when we're doing the wrong thing. And as long as I follow that path, as I'm not perfect, I'm not a saint, of course. Uh, one of the reasons why I work so hard is I'm trying to make up for uh, such sins as I have committed in my life. And uh, that's what keeps me going, keeps me focused, and keeps me following the light rather than the darkness. Let me read some social media. Thanks, uh, Samuel, uh, for that. Uh, 30427 says, U.S. at it again, but it's not going so well. They got to punch harder. And Louis Duncan said they're trying, that's to overthrow uh, Imran Khan, but I think he may survive it. Well, if the election happens, Lewis, as I said earlier, I believe he'll sweep the country. He really will sweep the country. And then all these betrayers uh, will uh, have to face the consequences of that. M.N. Nazim said, yes, he survived. The motion was dismissed by the deputy speaker. Imran Khan fought to the last ball, being the cricketer he was. And Arohyadav says hats off to Imran Khan for fighting back against the warmongers in the West. Imran Khan is the son of Pakistan, like Putin is the son of Russia. And Soren Ropstorff says the U.S. is failing on every front at the minute, and its support outside Europe and North America is next to be gone. And Tomislav says there are three countries in line. Pakistan for an Asian lesson, Hungary for EU unity, and Serbia, not much significance, but they are 
so used to punishing it. And George says, May Imran Khan teach the world not to let governments bow to external bribes or promises. Strength from within. Let true democracy shine its light upon those who'd sell out their country. And Kevin Hughes says, destroying the economy and impoverishing Europe removes a huge market for Chinese produce. It might sound like a conspiracy theory, but it's actually in American economic interests to do that. You're absolutely correct uh, about that. Let me hear from California. Why wouldn't I want to go to California where Josh is on the line? Go ahead, Josh. Good evening, George. How are you today? By the grace of God, good. Thank you. What would you like to say? Well, I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on the genuine prospects for peace as you see it, not only in Ukraine, but in Palestine and Yemen and everywhere else. Well, there are three big uh, uh, fronts, of course. Let me stick with Ukraine uh, for the minute. Um, I will touch on the other two. Uh, but uh, on Ukraine, uh, if, uh, if logic prevails, uh, then the Turkish uh, peace process and negotiations will prevail when they uh, resume this week. The question is whether the Ukrainian government is free to settle. And uh, by free to settle, I mean, are they, number one, free of U.S. pressure to settle? And number two, free of fascist and far-right pressure inside the Ukrainian military and inside the Ukrainian polity uh, itself to settle? If the answer to those two questions is yes, then there will be a peace agreement, perhaps even this week. Uh, I do think that whilst you might imagine Joe Biden wants to keep the war going, and of that I'm sure uh, they have the Afghanistan uh, syndrome in mind uh, of uh, prolonging it and bleeding Russia and causing economic and social problems back in Russia by a prolonged war, uh, that, that I'm sure is true, but it isn't true in Ukraine, uh, and neither Quite quickly, will it be true in Europe? The uh, German people have begun turning on their unholy, grotesque uh, alliance, uh, government between the Social Democrats and the Greens. The Greens in Germany, like the Greens everywhere in my experience, are actually war lovers, they're war mongers, and they are driving the German government policy at this point in time, but the workers on whom the SPD, the main partner in the coalition, the workers have begun quickly to rise up because they're the ones who are going to be made unemployed. They're the ones who are going to be made poorer and colder uh, by the German government's uh, uh, policy. But in what is perhaps a crucial new development, the German employers have begun to rise up and say to the government, listen, our economy is going to be destroyed. Our manufacturing sector is going to close down in a week or two weeks if you don't stop this ludicrous posturing over the issue of paying for gas in rubles. What is so extraordinary about paying a country for its produce in that country's money. It's, there's nothing unusual or extraordinary about that idea at all. So between the hammer of the German uh, employers and the anvil of the German working class, I think you might see a beginning of a capitulation by the German government and the other governments in Europe who are not as rich as Germany. Places like Hungary, like Slovakia, like the Czech Republic, are already saying, we'll have to pay in rubles. We can't afford uh, to go without Russia's gas. So the European Union end of things may very rapidly begin to rattle down. And that in turn will put pressure on Zelensky in Ukraine and on even Biden in the White House, because of course, 
the, the revolt that's begun in Germany might well spread to the United States as prices rise and shortages mount. Uh, I, I think there's no prospect of peace in Palestine uh, because you cannot have peace in Palestine without justice and there is no prospect of justice in Palestine. So that conflict will continue. There's now a ceasefire for Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak to all Muslims that are following the show. Uh, there's a ceasefire. Uh, for not 30 days of Ramadan, but 60 days. In that 60 days, a political settlement has got to be found. I very much hope that it will be, and I have some uh, reason for hoping uh, that it will. Josh, thanks uh, for that uh, call. In 1987, the late Duchess of Windsor's gems were sold for a record price of 31 million pounds, six times the estimate. What was her name? Bessie Wallace, Wallace Gromit, or Wallace Simpson? You can tell me after the break. George, the deep state, we mentioned it before. So rather than fear-mongering that everything is going on at the moment, with the COVID, the wars, blah, 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 why aren't we all addressing the deep state rather than this fear-mongering that's going over and over again? How do you address it? What I'm trying to get across, and hopefully your listeners will understand this, there is a deep state at work, and you know that. Everybody what? knows that. That's a statement of the bleeding obvious. So, oh, so let's do something about that. Rather than rushing and rolling what? about the Give us a lead. Be, be our leader. Be, be, be our leader, Dell. Who are the deep states? Yeah. Oh, what a brilliant question. Uh, those, those are all over us. And what should we do about them? We should uh, make them accountable. <laughs> I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to work out whether you're in the territory of shape-shifting lizards, or you're talking oh, about please. MI5 and MI6. Please don't turn into a circus, George. You know full well what's going on. And please. Don't I do. I do. Me. I do. I'm just struggling to get from you what it is we should be doing about them. What should I do about MI5 and MI6, and how should I do it? Just stand up and go, there's something really wrong here. And there's something up. really wrong here. There you are. I've there sorted it. Go. I've sorted it, Del. Thanks for the call. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. And the answer, of course, is Wallace Gromit. I, I mean, uh, Wallace Simpson, 31 million pound for her jewels. Uh, now, uh, the poll is still running. 5,760 people have voted. Is Pakistan's prime minister next for regime change? On Twitter, it's yes 73, no 27. On YouTube, it's yes 74, no 26. And on Telegram, it's yes 80 and no 20. So you've got, uh, what, another uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, maybe 15, uh, to vote on that on my uh, Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel, and on my Telegram. Thanks to everyone who's donated uh, to the Mother of All Talk Shows to keep it going. Uh, some people have been very generous, uh, and a significant number of people have donated. I don't have the final number yet, but all I can say is, I'm sorry to say, it's not enough. Uh, so you still have an hour and 10 minutes uh, to make your donation. I've never asked you for anything before. 
I've done 150 of these shows. Millions and millions of you have enjoyed them. Uh, and all I'm asking now is that you make a small donation. It can be one dollar. One dollar. A small donation. But I'm asking you all to do it. Because if you don't do it, we might well have to close this show as we've been forced to close the moats extra uh, on a Wednesday night. Uh, now, Wayne is in Cheshire. He's a good caller. Let's hear from him again. Wayne, welcome. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> um, welcome, sir. I'd like to um, donate £10 for the show. Um, Thanks, Wayne. Thanks for that, my friend. Right. Um, this, this, uh, no one's talking about this, um, even on the corporate media um, and the underground media and everything. It's quite concerning to me. Now, I think when I tell you, it might prick your memory. Um, when the Berlin Wall went down and the USSR collapsed in the early 1990s, um, there was a situation where at Bermansk, the, the nuclear submarines and some of the nuclear aircraft carriers basically were beached and they were rotting away and Russia didn't have the money or the expertise to decommission them. So what happened was they asked America and America said, yes, we'll give it on one condition. And one of the conditions they said, we want to decommission the suitcases. So I said, what are you talking about? This is mainstream media at the time. We said, we know about the nuclear weapons in the suitcases. They were specially made. They were out throughout Eastern Europe. So Russia said, yes, we will get them back. You can decommission them. They get, they get most, most of them back, but they said some have gone missing or been stolen. And they, were, they went missing in Ukraine. Well, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm hell of a intrigued, Wayne, as I'm sure the rest of the audience is, uh, and we definitely need to uh, look into it. It's, it's, I'm seeing a, a movie, a documentary, or even a feature film coming in front of my eyes uh, of the suitcase, the dirty bomb uh, in a suitcase. But Ukraine is undoubtedly, uh, I've got to say this, uh, uh, it pains me to say it, the source of many bad things in Europe and in the world. Uh, from organ donations to, uh, to sex trafficking and all kinds of things. It has been uh, run uh, by bad people. Even the guy that was overthrown in 2014, by the way, he was also bad. Uh, he was not overthrown because he was bad. He was overthrown because the Americans didn't trust him on geopolitical issues. But he was a corrupt individual. And there have been many corrupt individuals, including the present one, in charge of Ukraine. Leave them in charge of a nuclear suitcase. I wouldn't leave them in charge of a dog. That's the truth of the matter. Wayne, an intriguing call. No doubt people will provide further and better particulars. Marcus is in Chorley in England. Go ahead, Marcus. Good, good evening, George. Um, evening. The way we're going with with all these uh, price hikes and stuff like that, we're going quietly, quite clearly, we're, we're on the path to walking around with a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread. Yeah, well, the, the inflation um, is enormous here and even worse in the United States. Yeah, and... People are going. People have also been saying, "Oh well, well, Vladimir could nuke us," as opposed to starving to death. Uh, how come being nuked is actually a better situation? No, it isn't. Uh, there's nothing worse no, than no, it's being not, nuked but... because there will be nothing left. I don't think we're going to starve. Uh, but I was listening to the news there. It's not often I agree with anything that a Labour spokesperson says, but I agree with them on that. Uh, there will have to be rationing. Uh, now, everything's rationed, Marcus, as you know. It's either rationed by price uh, or it's ra and availability, or it's rationed uh, by, uh, by government uh, regulation. Everything is rationed. In, uh, in our society, and either petrol will become so expensive that only the richest people can buy it, 
gas will be so expensive that only the richest people can warm themselves, uh, and food will become so expensive that only the richest people will be able to eat, and the rest of us will be on thin gruel indeed. Uh, so that's the, that's the new world order that these people have plunged us into. Truck driver, but, uh, with, the, with the way that diesel's going through the roof and, and, yeah. and fuel's definitely going yeah. through the roof, yeah. I, I've actually well, had it, to go onto a government contract because I know that I'll get employed. Well, I it's, will now, be employed, it's now one power, near where I am now, and I'm not telling you where I am because we're avoiding the incoming. Uh, it's yes, 187 okay. for diesel. One pound 87 a litre for diesel. I filled my car up the other day, and it, it was already nearly a quarter full. I filled it up. It was 101 pounds. And I've yeah. got a Volvo. A Volvo. We're not talking a Cadillac here. A family car, 101 I... pounds for just over three quarters uh, of a tank. Now, people will not be able to do that for much longer, Marcus. About a month ago, I filled my truck up. It was 500 quid for the, for the tank. The following week, it was 700 quid. What is that for a truck? On top. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Unbelievable. At, at no point and it's not stopping it. yet. It's not stopping yet, Marcus. No, no, no. We no. ain't we ain't seen nothing yet. This inflation no, hasn't people. even properly started yet. That's what I'm telling people. It's the tip of the iceberg, and we're going to get no. effed on a monument, monumental scale. And people do not understand where this is going and how no. bad this is going to be. Unbelievable, Marcus. Great and, call, and, mate. Uh, Kevin is in Grimsby on Imran Khan. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, hello, George. Um, Hi. Yes, uh, just a few days ago, um, one of the important things I noticed uh, about this whole Imran Khan business, there's background, obviously, to the situation today. It's criticisms in the past and um, work. But... Uh, Imran Khan, a few days ago, the Guardian and other sources have mentioned this, uh, that he, he said, he claimed that uh, he'd been threatened by Washington. Um, they w have been pressing him for a while now to have um, American base, a military base in Pakistan. Now, recently, I mean, America has got seven, about 750 foreign U.S. military bases spread over about 80 countries. And um, recently, Imran Khan, I noticed, um, th th there's been some countries that have, haven't have been friendly with their neighbors are shaking hands to, to stand up with a multipolar world, you know, uh, being born against this unipolar like American. Yes. And, and Imran Khan recently applauded um, his neighbor uh, India for standing up to America. You know, I mean, they, they wouldn't even entertain some of the top UK officials trying to plead and trying to, uh, and India has said, no, we have fuel and, uh, and we, rupees to rubles with Russia. We have a lot of trade. We're not going to sanction them. Uh, and uh, he, he had a bit of criticism by some of the anti-Indian Pakistan people because the, there is this sort of background, yeah, mixed yeah. sort of feeling. Well, look, uh, so, Kevin, you're, uh, you're absolutely right. The tectonic plates are shifting. Russia has the best possible relations with India and the best possible relations with China. China does not have great relations with India. This could be a bridge, a Eurasian bridge, and I hope it will include Pakistan, a new political and economic uh, uh, entity. Well, look, uh, I've got a break for the news, but you've no idea who we've got coming up next. Only one of the Fleet Street legends. Stay tuned.
Pakistan's president has dissolved parliament, a step towards early elections, following an attempt to remove Prime Minister Imran Khan from office. It comes after parliament's deputy speaker refused to hold a vote of no confidence that Khan was expected to lose. Khan claims the United States is leading a conspiracy to remove him because of his criticism of US policy and other foreign policy decisions he has taken. Opposition politicians have ridiculed the allegation and the US has denied this. Khan has also been critical of America's war on terror. Khan visited Moscow to meet President Vladimir Putin as Russia was launching the invasion of Ukraine. The Prime Minister is widely believed to have come to power with the help of Pakistan's army, but now observers say they have fallen out. His political opponents seized the opportunity to demand the no-confidence vote after persuading a number of his coalition partners to defect to them. On Sunday, Information Minister Fawad Shundri told MPs that Pakistani officials had told of an operation for a regime change by a foreign government. This, he said, went against the constitution and the deputy speaker chairing the session, a close ally of the prime minister, proceeded to declare the vote unconstitutional. The opposition had now filled a petition to the country's Supreme Court, which is assessing whether the decision not allow a vote of no confidence against the prime minister is valid. At least six people have been killed and ten injured in a shooting in the centre of Sacramento, police in California's state capital say. People fled through the streets after rapid gunfire rang out in an area packed with restaurants and bars in the early hours of today. No suspect is yet in custody in the wake of the shootings. They took place around 2am in, in an area at 10th Street in K, a few streets from the state capitol building. Britain's Transport Secretary has said energy will not be rationed in the UK, despite pressures on supplies globally. Grant Shapps ruled this out after Labour's shadow business secretary suggested ministers might need to prepare for rationing. Some European countries have moved towards rationing as energy costs rise and supplies tighten. Shapps said the energy strategy would be announced later this week. Plans to expand nuclear and wind power are expected to form part of the strategy, which has been delayed amid cost concerns. Conservative MP David Warburton has told friends that he has been admitted to a psychiatric hospital after allegations about his behaviour were made in a Sunday newspaper. The MP has said that he's being treated for severe shock and stress, adding, this has been sheer hell. The Somerton and From MP has had his Tory whip withdrawn, pending an investigation into allegations about his conduct, which are being examined by Parliament's Independent Complaints and Grievances Scheme. Prince Andrew returned from the Falklands War a changed man, he said in a now-deleted piece posted on his ex-wife's Instagram account. The Duke of York recalled his time as a helicopter pilot in the conflict 40 years ago in three posts on Saturday, and only hours later, all posts were removed. It is unclear why the 700-word account was taken down. Andrew gave up the right to use His Royal Highness in an official capacity in January. This was when the Queen stripped her son of his honorary military roles as he faced a US civil action over sexual assault allegations, which he denied. Virginia Gough sued Andrew for allegedly sexually assaulting her on three occasions when she was 17. The case later reached a multi-million pound settlement out of court. The official Telegram channel of the Russian Defence Ministry has shared a claim that reports of civilian deaths in the UK town of Bukha are fake. Videos from the city, which was recently retaken by Ukrainian forces, appear to show civilians lying dead in the street. Some of them apparently with their hands tied have shocked the world. The reposted report claims that Russian forces left the city on the 30th of March. Where have these pictures been for four days? The fact that they were absent only confirms that this is fake, he quoted. The Russian Defence Ministry have not commented officially on the situation in Bukha. The report mentioned above was reposted by the ministry. The Post then claimed that after Russian forces left Bukha, the Ukrainian armed forces subjected the city to artillery strikes, which also could have led to civilian deaths. A mass grave found in the city, it says, was created by the Ukrainians. The Taliban announced today a ban on the cultivation of narcotics in Afghanistan, the world's biggest opium producer. In a statement it said, if anyone violates the decree, the crop will be destroyed immediately and the violator will be treated according to the Shari law. The order announced at a news conference by the Ministry of Interior in Kabul said, the order said the production, use or transportation of other narcotics was also banned. 
drug control has been one major demand of the international community of the Islamic group, which took charge of the country in August and is seeking formal international recognition in order to wind back sanctions that are severely hampering banking, business and development. And finally, US airline Alaska has announced that it has launched new gender neutral uniform guidelines for flight attendants. The airline said it would also collaborate with a designer to develop gender neutral uniform items for frontline employees, such as flight attendants, customer service agents and uniformed lounge employees. The announcement comes after a 2021 allegation by an Alaska Airlines employee that the airline's uniforms policy discriminated against employees whose gender expression does not fit the male and female dress codes, particularly non-binary employees, those whose gender identity falls out of the binary of male or female. The previous policy required flight attendants to wear either male or female uniforms. The airline also regulated other aspects of dress like hairstyle, makeup and jewellery based on the worker's assumed gender. The company has also created personal pronoun pins that employees can choose to wear with their uniforms. That's all your news for now. I'm Elliot King. <laughs> Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge where there are no tuition fees. Well, there's the second poll of the evening. Have we now seen the anticipated false flag operation in Ukraine? A, yes, B, no. You can vote on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel, please subscribe, and on my Telegram uh, channel. Now, news from the podcast. I, I had to read this twice. I honestly did. Had to read this twice. Big thanks, obviously, to all our subscribers and listeners to the Moats podcast. For the older amongst you, a podcast is the distilled version, uh, about half as long as the three-hour mother of all talk shows, which we only launched a couple of months ago, I think, a few months ago, uh, which has become a phenomenon uh, on the Internet. Uh, and also my new Wednesday show, The Galloway Show, which I hope you'll tune into on my YouTube channel, exclusively on YouTube on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. That's also got a podcast, which has also gone off like a rocket. Now, you get them on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. But this week, we had our largest ever week of downloads in the tens of thousands. But in recent weeks, the podcast has been the number one political podcast in Algeria, Ghana, Oman, Namibia, Ecuador, Slovenia, Zimbabwe, Malaysia, Bulgaria, Iceland, Kuwait, Costa Rica, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Tanzania, and now in Singapore, number one in those countries. The podcasts also are regular in the top 50 of China, please note, Russia, France, Spain, India, Israel, Brazil, Pakistan, Canada, Hong Kong, and Japan, as well as being active in 79 other top 100s around the world. So it's a media phenomenon, and it's tearing up the mainstream uh, media monopoly. Please uh, download it on Apple or Spotify and leave us a five-star review like Sanam in London who said, George, I've been watching your show uh, for a long time and I must admit that you are a true leader and very courageous man to carry on your work of exposing the truth and showing us the other side of the picture, which always gets blocked by the US and the West through their media. God bless you. Always Sanam in London. Very touching, Sanam. Thank you very much uh, for that. A couple of calls then. William in Sheffield. Oh, oh Go ahead, uh, William. Nice to hear from you. Hi, George. Um, Hi. I was just wondering um, what you make of the fact that, um, given that you're on the left of politics, that there are so many people who are, uh, seem to be like Marxists, sort of in high positions, like uh, Christina Georgieva at the IMF, Stoltenberg has some connections at NATO, Tedros at the World Health Organization, 
Guterres um, at the UN. Um, and I was just wondering if you think that this whole thing is possibly being uh, orchestrated by the uh, New World Order to bring in a one world government? Well, I can't think of any group of people less Marxist than the group of people you just adumbrated. I don't know where you got your information that they are former uh, Marxists. Uh, they may be, you may be right. Uh, but the, the key word is former. Uh, the, the idea that all of this that we see in the world is Marxism could not be farther from the truth. Indeed, Marx predicted that capitalism would bring all of these things 150, more than 150 years ago now, uh, summed up in one phrase that all that is solid uh, will will melt uh, away into air and the, all that is sacred will be profaned. And isn't that exactly what's happened? These things that are sacred to us have been profaned and the solid has melted into air, that which we once thought we could rely upon, that were ours forever, uh, but are no longer. So uh, I, I'm not aware of the Marxist background of any of those people, but if you're right and uh, they are former Marxists, I'm afraid the emphasis is on former rather than on Marxists. Thanks for the call. John is in Yorkshire too. Uh, he wants to talk about the BBC. Go ahead, John. Hello, George. Thank you for having me on Hi. the show. Welcome. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say this, that I think that as well as what we've got is the horrors of Ukraine, there is a growing realization with literally millions of people around the world that one of the biggest enemies that we're all facing now is in fact mainstream media. And yeah, I uh, what I want that. to do is yeah. put a number of, uh, I want to put a number of um, topics to you that I've been covering for the last couple of weeks. I've basically put three or four complaints into the BBC through their formal approach. And when they've asked me whether I wanted a response, I've said yes. These all related to various videos that perhaps you've talked about in the last couple of weeks, but I just want to talk about this in, in the context of what I'm talking about. So the first one was this, these videos that were showing black people either being appearing to have been stopped from getting onto trains at a Ukraine station, or in another one where a girl appeared to be who was black, um, who was literally asked to, or dragged off a train. The way I worded the complaint was not to say that these were absolutely 100% authentic, because I didn't know, but I would have thought, based on the fact that they were black individuals and we're living in a society now where the rights of black people and their ability to have their voice being heard was so important that this should have at least been investigated and either one way or another the BBC would say either these are authentic or they're not. The reply that I got basically didn't actually answer that question. It just said something on the lines of, with links, look, these are other issues that we've dealt with, uh, John, although, you know, we, we're not aware of the specific one that you're talking about. So I left it at that. The next one was one very recently. This is to do with the one with the Russian soldiers. So um, I asked them again, have you fact-checked this story? And if you have, what conclusions have you come to? And the response from this one was for them to ask me to send in the video. Now, incredibly, within the day later on, a, on American news feed, I saw a, an actual official BBC web page actually addressing this, but I didn't actually see it on the BBC website in this country. And, um, you know, so, we, so I left it at that. Um, I mean, so in summary, George, I think what we're faced with is this, and you've touched on it before. 10, 15 years ago, we had access to basic newspapers in this country and the mainstream BBC, ITV, Channel 4. But things have changed now, and this is the core of the problem. It's because there are so many people independently who are as quick as what mainstream media are, are getting information and getting information out there before anyone can close it down. Of course, there are times when this information is closed down. But this is the problem that these people are facing. And when you've had this 
um, in, when you had your interview earlier on with Ivory Hecker, that links in perfectly with what we're faced with. Which news do well, people Well, look, look uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and in a free market, which is what we're told uh, we live in, uh, people must be free to choose uh, the sources that they trust and believe in. But what we have is the monopoly closing down uh, sources of information that are widely followed. Otherwise, there would be no point in closing them down, if you get my meaning. John, it is a brilliant call, and it perfectly tees up my next guest, who is Martin J. Fleet Street legend, now an independent operator in the world of news and journalism, and a damn good one too. Martin, thanks uh, very much for joining us. I hope you heard that call uh, from John in Yorkshire. Uh, he's got his finger on the button, doesn't he? The, the, the truth is, people no longer trust the mainstream media but are being stopped in many cases, dissuaded algorithmically in others, from seeking out alternative information. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, mainstream media itself over the last 10 or 15 years has made a huge transition, and in my opinion, gone in the wrong direction, gone it's sort of piggybacked onto the trend of social media. Now, social media, you ask any skeptical journalists of my age what he thinks of social media as a as a base of uh, information as a reliable source and it's you know it's um 95 percent of it is is influence um, uh, biased um, unendorsed unverified and 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 in often in many cases um just sexed up nonsense so the main, mainstream media has gone down that road invested in the, the model of perceived truth rather than actual truth and that's as a journalist of my age i've witnessed this in the last 30 years that's that that leap and as your caller was pointing out i think people now don't have the confidence anymore they don't know where to look for their news but they made a conscious decision um, which is to to craft and to sculpt the news sources that they want to look at which correspond to their political outlooks to their their own narrative um, because they haven't got time we don't have time anymore I don't know if you've noticed, to read newspaper articles. You know, now we are seeing, um, I think the corporations pick up on this, that um, media now is all about titles rather than content. And uh, sadly, what's happened is nuance or detail or verified information has become a sort of collateral casualty of the news gathering process. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very skeptical when I look at anything coming from Ukraine at the moment, um, because I've, uh, I've recently written about some of the war zones that I've been in from the early 90s to now, and um, I see patterns just keep on re-emerging. And uh, we are now living in a period where this new generation of journalists who are more savvy about, mainstream, about, about social media and the trends of social media um, and, and not quite the same caliber of journalists, I would argue, from the 1980s and 1990s who went to those war zones. This new generation of journalists, I think, um, are more um, biased and are more um, susceptible to falling into the traps of deciding uh, their own narrative before they even get to the taxi and get to the airport and get out there in the first place. So. Um, you know, there's very, very little that I see coming from Ukraine, which I believe. Well, uh, the uh, for people of a certain age, you and me included, uh, it used to be the case that there was a phalanx of what you might call anti-war journalists, or certainly journalists that whose predisposition was to disbelieve, you know, not nothing is true until it's been officially denied kind of thing. Uh, the Vietnam War was a classic of that genre. Of course, there was loads of embedded pro-war guff, but there was also uh, on the big newspapers, the Sydney Morning Herald, the New York Times, the uh, uh, Manchester Guardian and so on, there was, there was uh, if not a phalanx, then a core of people 
uh, that would you would go to to get the other side of the story. Journalists now, including so-called war correspondents, who don't seem to be getting very close to the war in Ukraine, it's, an, it's, the, it's the, a war in history where the means of recording things has never been greater, but the amount of stuff being recorded has never been less. Uh, it seems to me that the, uh, the legion of journalists and broadcasters are basically just stenographers to power. It's exactly the word I was going to use. You took it right out of my mouth. I would, I would say the same thing, yeah. And this is, this is linked to the financial crisis of media. The media doesn't have the money anymore to really invest in old-school journalism, which takes time and takes resources. And I think part of that new process, the new, new uh, ideology from the big corporations that control media is to perhaps form a stronger alliance with the state. And the state has indicated to us in Britain uh, that uh, there's nothing really to look at in Ukraine. There's no real need to look at the details in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians are the victims and Russia is the aggressor. So just get out there and get the pictures and stick to that narrative. And it's that generation of uh, journalists, you know, the, the, the anti-war journalists, unfortunately, they've all died. They've died off. The whole genre has died off because I think big media looks at war reporting and doesn't see the value for detail, doesn't see the value for investing in anybody who's going to ask difficult questions because that is not going to be picked up very well by uh, the market at home. You've got all these, you've got this competition between the giants to get the clicks. And anybody who goes in the opposite direction and starts asking awkward questions just throws the spanner in the whole works and, and uh, causes mayhem. And, you know, it's a, it's a funny old thing, but my generation of journalists, you know, are often called um, difficult to work with. Whenever I hear those words, whenever I hear those words from the generation of editors today who find guys like me difficult to work with, I always think that's a compliment because the journalists are difficult to work with. The best journalists are usually difficult to work with because the, the best journalists go to places like Ukraine and look for the truth rather than the perceived truth. And, you know, it's got worse and worse as, as the time has gone by. I mean, if you, you mentioned Vietnam. Vietnam was a turning point because Vietnam was really the starter's pistol for a new breed, a new um, idea from uh, America to, to take more control of what journalists would be doing. They, the, the Vietnam model blew up in their faces, allowing journalists to have the freedom to move around and report anything. Generals at that time said no more. And when the next opportunity came, first Gulf War in 1991, we saw embedding, and uh, which is really nothing more than really imprisoning journalists, you know, when you think about it. And uh, people accepted that. You know, people didn't question that. They thought it was better to have embedded journalists and to get some information, no matter how skewed or perverted it might be, rather than have no reporting at all. And I think this is the beginning of the end. Because what we saw in, in the Gulf War was we saw the narrative from America just enforced, just, 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 just asserted and endorsed by, by most of the journalists who signed up to agreeing to go along with the trips that were arranged for them, um, agreeing to sit on the press conferences with the generals and just replicate or be stenographers to what they've been told, um, your word earlier. You know, and um, really, that, that for me, that laid the foundations of where we are today. If you fast forward to, um, uh, to, to the Yugoslav war, where we saw the same patterns, the same uh, situation just repeating itself over and over again, you know, the oversimplification of uh, the war, how, how media and, and the State Department and the CIA were so keen to actually push everything into two neat piles, you know, to, 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 to make Milosevic um, the, the mad dictator who was causing all the problems, and to basically to make uh, uh, Tuchman in Croatia an icon of uh, Western values and liberty. And that wasn't at all the case. I mean, it was really a big lie from the word go. And the war, which ended very quickly in Yugoslavia, uh, if you remember, um, in the summer of 95, when the Americans finally went, went, went ahead with their illegal bombing campaign by NATO, illegal because we didn't get the backing of the UN Security Council, thinking just went ahead and did what we wanted to do. 
that was based on a lie as well. It was based on uh, the, the same sort of sloppy reporting that, was, that I think we're seeing in Ukraine now. It was based on um, uh, two marketplace attacks which were immediately attributed to the Serbs perched up in the hillsides around Sarajevo. We know after, we know now, we knew a couple of years after, that that was not the case at all, that if somebody had given the wink and the nod to the, uh, to the Muslims, that uh, if an atrocity were to, were to happen, that would be the starter's pistol for the NATO airstrikes against Milosevic. And uh, the Muslims went ahead and did that themselves. They arranged those attacks themselves. You know, I'm wondering whether we're seeing the same thing in Ukraine today, because there's so much information that I'm watching every day on social media. There's so many reports made by British journalists where they're using more and more video footage from people's phones that they're unable to to verify. And if you look yeah, at yeah. Um, in, in 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 Croatia, we we had uh, these U.S. generals come out, set up an entire public relations operation, you know, working very closely uh, with Tuchman and his people, and we saw um, information and reports distorted. They didn't have the expression in those days fake news, but that's really what they were doing. And I'm, I'm wondering whether the same public relations exercise and the same money from the State Department and the CIA is funding these public relations uh, executives that are producing well, thank these God, stories. Thank God you're, uh, you're still there and still kicking. How do people follow your work, Martin? Uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Martin R J E Y, or they can just Google my name um, uh, for Patreon and if, if they wish. Um, but I've just re written that uh, that very article. They might want to read that on um, uh, on on my Twitter on my main Twitter page as well. They'll, they'll find it there about uh, the relationship between uh, media Fabulous. and the war zones. Fabulous, Martin J, a legend of Fleet Street who never went bent. Thanks for that, Martin, and thanks for all your truth-telling. Uh, let's go to Charlie in Canada. Charlie on line one, go ahead. Hi, George. Um, thanks for all the work you do. Thanks, um, Thank you. A couple of things. The first thing is the alleged um, atrocities by the Russians being exposed as they withdraw from certain towns. It's yeah. The news in Canada is very one-sided. But uh, yesterday, just yesterday, they showed um, some of the you know, alleged atrocities of bodies and so on. But one of the things they showed, I uh, pointed out, was a sea mine, you know, these big mines, in a, damage, in a uh, burnt out car, vehicle. Uh, and supposedly left by the Russian, the Russians, um, in an attempt to cause more havoc, etc. I'd just like to point out that the first thing, in, in terms of sea mines, it's been the Ukrainians who have mined the Sea of Azov. Um, and they, they have disputed And, and that. some of them, so, some of the mines have ended up in the Bosphorus. That's correct, yeah. However, however, I would draw your attention and your listeners and viewers to Patrick Lancaster. Patrick Lancaster is a very brave American who has covered the Donbass uh, um, for the last eight years. Yeah, More recently, I'm, a follower. Got, I'm a follower of his, yeah. Yeah. More recently, he's gone into Maripol. And yep. he's interviewed the people who are coming out of the basements, and I won't go into everything there or what they've said. No, people, uh, we don't uh, have time. We don't have time, but people should definitely follow Patrick Lancaster, a top-class uh, chap. Uh, Charlie in Canada, thanks for that. Sorry it's short. So many people trying to get through. Simon is in London. Go ahead, Simon. How are you doing, George? You okay? All good, sir. What would you like to say? That's great. I don't know whether you noticed um, the World Cup draw this week. Um, early on this week, I was predicting, and I actually told my friend, wouldn't it be great if Iran got the USA, uh, uh, England, and also another Anglosphere country? I actually said Canada, but it's likely that more, uh, most likely that they'll probably get either Wales or Scotland, possibly even Ukraine, you know? 
Now, isn't it yeah. interesting how every single uh, media outlet in the West have ignored the fact that this is a big freaking deal, you know? The fact that Iran gets a shot at two countries that have effectively put huge sanctions on it, even now that they're going out of sanctions, they've, uh, they've, um, they've, they've placed these horrible... Um, uh, there, there was a treaty that was rejected by Iran this week, if you remember, uh, that was written by Britain, I, I believe. But my question to yourself was, um, what would happen? W would Iran be in a good position now to invite the Russians, much like Saudi Arabia did uh, during the Gulf War, to effectively have a security base in Iran? Wouldn't that be... A common sense uh, way to go for them. Yeah, and a Chinese one uh, too. I, I would uh, if I was them, but I have no idea what their uh, foreign policy attitude to that would be. In any case, uh, they have an economic and a strategic relationship uh, with India, with Russia, and with China. And nobody will mess with them uh, because Iran is a very powerful country. It's a very big country, a very young country with uh, great scientists and a real science base and a real military and a military that uh, doesn't need to be supplemented by mercenaries. But as you described uh, the, <laughs> as, you, as you described the World Cup, my, my, I began to lick my lips, Simon. What? A, that'll be the mother of all battles. Iran versus the USA and Iran uh, versus uh, the United Kingdom. A quick break and then back to the calls. There is no trick other than hard work, creativity, care and recognizing that duty is more important than love. The booming voice of Robert Maxwell. An arrogant man who used his publishing empire to gain him power and influence. But in this shocking account, never told before in this way, George Galloway recalls his first encounter with Maxwell. It looked like a, a grizzly bear uh, advancing towards me and punches me with these giant fists like sides of ham right in the solar plexus so hard that I literally bent double. Then, after George exposed Maxwell as a crook in Parliament, it was war. Every one of his papers, the Daily Mirror, then following the Sunday Mirror, the Sunday People, the Daily Record, then a few days later, the Sunday Mail in Scotland. Even the European, which he then owned. All over Galloway. Scottish Daily News journalist Ron Mackay was there. Every night, presumably when he had a drink in him, he would boom over the tannoy about the, 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 the cretins, the fools. The, the majority of the workforce believed that he would take it over and their jobs would be secure. But of course he didn't. He just disappeared. And then... The millionaire newspaper publisher Robert Maxwell is dead. What really happened? Did Robert Maxwell jump or was he pushed? It could be that he went out to, as he did, miturate over the side of the boat. I'm with Ghislaine Maxwell in that I lean towards the murder. This is Maxwell the monster. You said what is my secret. I will let you and your viewers know what it is. I'm not attached to property. Consequently, Losing or gaining, it means nothing to me. That's done tremendously well, that one, on, uh, on my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway, uh, where I also do a kind of after hours, after my midweek uh, show, the Galloway show, uh, so uh, do support that. Uh, I'm trying to build an independent media here and it can be done uh, without that kind of support. Now, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell had a setback uh, in the week in that uh, her demand for a retrial has been refused. Uh, so if you want my take on the Maxwell story, uh, then go to uh, Patreon. Now, thanks uh, for donating. Uh, here are the top three 
Donars, um, Andrew Pozniak, Shazia Ovesi, and Chiang, T-C-H-E-A-N-G, San. Thank you very much to you three and to everyone who's donated. I don't want to go all Bob Geldof on you, but uh, it, you have to donate something. You can't expect to uh, have this show coming out every week, produced by people who cannot be paid. Uh, you, you can't expect that. So even if it's one pound, you must donate. Now, you can do it uh, on the uh, PayPal, or there's that new feature I told you about, Super Chat, it's called, on the YouTube stream. Uh, so uh, if you go to uh, my YouTube channel, if you're not already on it, then hit the button called Super Chat. Please, just one pound from everybody. That's all I'm actually asking for. Am I not worth one pound? You get a cup of tea uh, for one pound. Eve is in Idaho. Go ahead, Eve. Hey, thank you for uh, having me on your show, uh, your Welcome, very uh, courageous show. Uh, but be before my point, I want to also, I would like to uh, to credit one of your callers. I think you had fantastic callers tonight, and uh, I think it was Mevelyn. And uh, what he said, I think, in one word, you 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 can read, you can summarize it, is that through the stock market. All Americans with a 401k have been transformed into war profiteers. Yeah. You still there, Eve? We've lost Eve. Let's go to Trevor in Cambridgeshire. Uh, Trevor, are you there? Yes, George, I'm here. Go ahead, sir. George, um, this is my second time calling in. Thank you very much uh, for taking my call. I really appreciate it. I think you're um, an absolute advocate for peace, and it's a, a great thing. I'm an ex-service person that was indoctrinated to hate certain people, and uh, luckily I've uh, worked my way away from that system. It's taken me many, many years, and... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a hard road. Now, when I first called up, I was I was um, struck by the the parallel between yourself and somebody called Gerald Salente in uh, in America, who's a, a great peace advocate. I was wondering if you if you um, you um, you sort of see yourself as something similar to Gerald Salente. I, and there's a second I, point. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know him. Tell me tell me more about him, and I'll check him out. Oh, he's a, he's a brilliant man, Gerald Salente. He's, uh, he's got uh, a magazine called The Trends Journal, so he forecasts um, things going forward, and he's, he's always spot on. You, sh you really should um, familiar familiarize yourself with him. I will. I and definitely will, yeah. You definitely should. And, and I, I see like, myself personally, because I was a, a, a service personnel, uh, yeah, I was a service person in, in, um, in Ireland, and... Um, you know, I've I've, I've been uh, I've suffered with complex PTSD for quite some time. Now, the people like Joe Salente and people like yourself are really, really helpful to people that are um, suffering with the uh, the negative effects of being involved in a war or you know in, in various conflicts. And um, so, I, I just want to. Put that forward and say, well, Thank I'll you definitely. You know what? Uh, well, God bless you for that, uh, Trevor. Uh, I've got a lot of friends, uh, ex-military friends. Uh, I'm I'm a leader of the Workers' Party of Britain. We have many, many ex-service personnel in our ranks. You should think maybe about joining us. Uh, but I went to uh, an event in Park Lane that Jim Davidson organised, uh, Care After Combat. And there was actually, in front of the defense secretary, who was, what's his name, Pike, don't tell him your name, Pike, uh, uh, Williamson, uh, was the defense secretary. And in front of him, a long queue of military people in regimental uh, dress, uh, formal dress, were waiting up to talk to me. And a lot of them, a lot of them, said the kind of things that you just kindly said. 
so don't think that our military are fools. They're not. They know the kind of people that are sending them into uh, these uh, useless, unnecessary wars. God bless you, Trevor. Thanks. Lee in Manchester. He's up next. Go ahead, Lee. I was just watching um, the episode on um, YouTube now uh, where you've got Igor Lopatonok on. Yeah, um, yeah. He, he, he made the film with, um, with, um, with uh, Oliver Stone. With the, all the, the great Oliver yeah. Stone, yeah. Yeah, so, so where, where, what, see, see, the Biden uh, family um, corruption that's been going on in the Ukraine for so many years, about 2007 or something like that, I think it started, but also Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House in America, her son is on a board of directors over there, John Kerry's Her son, son. Uh, John Kerry's son, Joe John Biden's Kerry's, son. Yeah, I mean, yeah, John Kerry's stepson. John Kerry's yeah. stepson is over there. Nancy Pelosi's yeah. son is, is over there. The, the, the Democrat Party... What first, um, what first attracted them to the Ukraine is what I'm asking myself, Lee, although I think I know the answer. Of course it is. It's gas and oil. Yeah. Um, it, 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 and it's not just that. It's, it's, it's the whole thing that's happening over there now is, is, is wholly orchestrated by uh, the Biden administration. And it's the Biden administration minus Biden that is there now. You know, it all started yeah. with them. Uh, are you not surprised, Lee, that this is not more of a scandal? I mean, I thought that the Hunter, you know, I, uh, it's, it's, I thought the Hunter Biden laptop would sink them, but they, they've just moved on. You know what it is? Is is you know they'll turn around, they'll go uh, like Nigeria is a corrupt country. They'll go, to, uh, you know, the Americans are so good at calling yeah. countries corrupt countries. America yeah. is the most corrupt country in the world. Yeah, and it's we're catching up, though, Lee. Do it. You know, you know, you know. We're, it's just we're, blatant. we're catching up, though, Lee. Well, well, from what you found out here, you know, they go on about the Azov Battalion. The Azov Battalion, up, and you know, you know, Majid Nawaz had it perfect last week. He turned around and said, "These aren't neo Nazis. They are Nazis. There's nothing new exactly. about them." Exactly. Nothing what is about neo? Nazis. What does the neo mean? They're waving the neo means the neo. Nazi flag. Neo. They're wa they're waving waving the SS it's insignia. They're, it's they're, you know I mean, what's neo about it? Nothing. They put neo Nothing. in front of it as if it's 16, kind of moderate, 16, a moderate, a moderate yeah. Nazi. Yeah. Unbelievable. Sixteen thousand Russian-speaking people have been killed in the past eight years. In the Donbass yeah. region, not, you know, nobody, six, years ago, six years ago, the BBC was reporting on um, on, on neo Nazis over there. So why why now has the narrative changed? Oliver Stone's film has been out since 2016. The second film yeah. came out in 2019. Then it gets banned three four weeks ago. You know, and now it's now it it's age got banned. It's only it's only thanks to is it Rumble. Uh, that we can see it uh, now. They, they forced it back out into the marketplace, but they banned it. They effectively hid it yeah, behind an iron curtain. Uh, yeah. Anyway, you know Lee, thanks. Uh, you know something? Yeah. Is, is, yeah. Is, is, you know, they turn around, they say, they say Ukraine is the most, seventh most corrupt country in the world. And, you know, you know America is the first. America yeah, is the most corrupt. Corrupting them? Oh, yeah. Who's corrupting and, them? Who's corrupting them? Look, and, thanks, and you know uh, thanks, Lee. No, I've got to go, Lee. I've got uh, so much uh, to do. Uh, can I uh, thank, please, uh, Bejoy Doss and Patricia Ryan, who joined the, uh, the, joined the ranks of uh, the handsome donators. I'm very, very grateful to you. Uh, that makes up for some of you who have not even given one dollar yet. So please, please, you must give. You must donate at least one dollar. Uh, now, my uh, poll, uh, have we now seen the anticipated false flag operation in Ukraine? Yes, 66, no, 34. Yes, 72, no, 28. Yes, 75, no, 25. You can still vote uh, until the end of the show on that. But I want to talk with a, another former a military man, a former U.S. Marine, now Bangkok-based geopolitical analyst 
and founder of the new atlas. And in a way, a new atlas is what is being created right now uh, before our eyes. The geographic borders may not change, but everything else is. His name is Brian Berletic, and I'm very glad that he has joined me. Now, Brian, uh, welcome to the show. So the Pakistan government has effectively been threatened uh, with regime change. The Sri Lankan cabinet, an hour ago, resigned en masse. India has been warned by the United States about its relations with Russia. Uh, the Asian uh, continent is attracting a lot of U.S. heat. The president of Kazakhstan just survived an assassination attempt. Kyrgyzstan had a coup. I mean, who's up to what, Brian? First of all, thank you so much for having me on. It's an honor and a privilege. And uh, we, we listened all throughout your program today about Ukraine. And we looked at uh, how the U.S. put pressure on Ukraine many years before any of this happened. And the U.S. is doing this everywhere, not, not just in Ukraine, not just a handful of countries. They do it all around the globe. And they're doing it to encircle and contain not just Russia, in the West, but also China in the East. And so Asia, obviously, it's a, it's a focal point for, I mean, the U.S. is primarily concerned with China and the inevitability of it surpassing the U.S. And they're doing everything that they can to contain China. And so what we see in Pakistan, it's not really just about Russia. It's about what this this conflict in Ukraine is supposed to springboard into, which is shifting all of this, everything that we see being done to Russia over Ukraine, all of it being shifted toward China. And uh, I've been in Southeast Asia um, all, almost my entire adult life, and I, I have watched the U.S. do this to every country here, the exact same things, uh, setting up the ground for color revolution, attempted color revolution in neighboring Myanmar right now. There's actually an armed conflict. Uh, I have kept an eye on Pakistan for many, many years. Uh, back in 2011, in, in order to derail the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the section going through Pakistan, the U.S. was openly in Congress talking about uh, independence for Balochistan, the southwest region of Pakistan. And they were talking about arming and backing militants and just carving territory off just to completely cut off the, the Belt and Road Initiative, the projects going through that region. So it, it really is a, it's a global project that the U.S. is working on. It has gone on for decades since the end of World War II. This has been the U.S. trying to reassert Western hegemony over all of these, these countries that tried to slip out from under the, the dark shadow of Western colonialism. A brilliant uh, a, a tour of the horizon there, a brilliant resume of, of what's happened. Let me take you back uh, to Pakistan because it is, it's a big domino, uh, Pakistan, because as I said in my introduction, it is, it's a double whammy. Uh, they had to get used to Pakistan having very close relations with China. But as long as it also had very close relations with the U.S., uh, they were up to a point prepared to accept that. But now that Imran Khan has said, "Who are we slaves uh, that you can order around? Then he's put his head above the parapet as a brave and noble man. Uh, is he going to survive it, Brian? I think we're seeing an inflection point where many countries are taking the risk to challenge the, the U.S. grip that they've had over them. A lot of countries that are perceived as allies of the U.S., they, they did that out of self-preservation. I think a lot of what Pakistan did uh, when it was, you know, an ally of the United States was for self-preservation. I mean, they're looking at the U.S. military in Afghanistan right next door, decimating the country and killing people. And also crossing the border and killing people in Pakistan. They, they, I think they wanted to try to minimize that and buy as much time as possible. And you'll see a lot of countries here in Southeast Asia doing exactly the same, trying to 
run out the clock, so to speak, uh, with the rise of China and the decline and withdrawal from the region of the United States, it's hard to predict whether uh, any one of these countries being targeted, including Pakistan, whether they'll survive this. There's so many things that the U.S. can do. Uh, those militants are still active in Balochistan, in Pakistan. The U.S. still supports and backs militancy in Pakistan. So there's so many things that they could use, if not the military or opposition politicians. They also have armed militants who, who I don't know. They do, remember, including. Uh, yeah. Sorry, go on. I was, I was going to say that these militants actually made an attempt on the Chinese ambassador's life not, not too long yeah. ago, that hotel that they bombed in Baluchistan. Right. Yeah, I was just going to make that point, and it's very good uh, that you did say that, uh, in, included amongst the pressure points that they have, are not just separatists in Baluchistan, but they have used in other parts of the world, maybe even in Pakistan, Islamist fanatic militants uh, against the government, against the state. They, they did it, of course, most famously in Afghanistan for a whole decade in the 1980s, uh, but they have done it in, in Syria until now. So it is possible that they could reawaken uh, the sleeping uh, serpents of Islamist fanaticism in Pakistan against the government of Imran Khan. Absolutely. And uh, we, we remember him saying, you know, admiring India's foreign policy and their independence and their ability to stand up against Washington. And who were the people who were complaining the loudest about that were, were some of these hardline extremists or, or people leading in that direction? And, and this is the nightmare of the United States, and I, I think also the, all of America's allies. The, the idea of all of these colonial time divisions that they created and still cultivate to this day, being minimized or erased, the, the idea of Pakistan someday in the future putting aside its differences with India and, and China likewise putting their differences aside and putting peace and prosperity uh, to the forefront this is their biggest fear, because those are the buttons that they like to push the most and to divide and destabilize countries uh, all around the well, world. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the big enchilada, the Eurasian uh, potential, isn't it? That if, uh, and, and Russia could play a, a bridging role uh, between India uh, and China, being very close to both, but prosperity and development in the Eurasian context, that is the big threat to U.S. hegemony. Absolutely. And again, countries that seem like they are allies of the United States. Uh, earlier in the program, uh, you, yourself and several of your guests noted how the U.S. is fighting Russia to the last Ukrainian, but also fighting Russia through all of Europe. They're, they're going to wreck the economies and the, the social stability of all of Europe to do this, they will do the exact same thing and much more eagerly with all of their so-called allies in all across Asia, especially India, especially anyone in Pakistan who imagines that they are somehow an ally of the United States, they are going to be used to the fullest extent. And then they will be discarded just like Georgia in 2008 after uh, they were convinced to attack Russia, and just like Ukraine is being right now decimated. This is what will happen to Pakistan. Well, uh, uh, let if me allowed. give you an example. Uh, yeah, if allowed. Uh, well, that's up to the people in this forthcoming general election, I hope. But uh, if you look at Kazakhstan, now, I know how hard the Kazakh uh, regime has tried to please the West, including stuffing gold into their mouths. I attended regularly for several years uh, the uh, media conference in, in Kazakhstan, and the man in the next door hotel room to me was a former director of the CIA. I know that because he was quote unquote sleepwalking in the middle of the night, trying to force his way into my hotel room. I'm not making that up. Uh, but. I know how hard the Kazakhs tried to 
keep the West sweet with contracts and, and outright bribery. Uh, they had people there, they flew them in, they gave them a week of luxury and you don't want to know what else. Um, but when it came to it, the US was ready to destroy Kazakhstan just um, months ago, uh, over, over Christmas, I think. They were ready to overthrow a president who's done nothing but try and please them. So this is a big lesson, isn't it, for those in power in the US. The US has no friends, only interests. Absolutely. And that, that is a really good example. And who came in and saved Kazakhstan? Everyone on both sides. Because what a lot of people uh, forget is that the opposition also suffers greatly when they you know, win in their, their goal of overthrowing a government. Look at Libya. Uh, how has the opposition in Libya, uh, with U.S. backing, overthrowing the, the government of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, how have they fared? How 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 much have they enjoyed life, peace, and prosperity since then? They haven't. And this is the fate that Kazakhstan narrowly escaped. And who, who did that? Who helped them do that? It was Russia. They have a shared fate. The United States is on the other side of the planet. It couldn't care less about what happens. They want what they want. And what they will do is take whatever you let them. So if you're constantly trying to please them, they will constantly take more. There needs to be a line drawn and a balance struck. And if nations fail to do this, they, they do it at their own detriment and could be uh, something that leads to their ultimate destruction. Brian, I'm very impressed by you. How do people follow your work? They, they can search the new Atlas on YouTube and then look in about and usually in the video description of each video, there's all kinds of information where else you can find my work. I, I have been deleted off. We were talking about uh, media censorship. I've been censored off of Twitter numerous times and I'm off off social media for the time being. So YouTube, the new so, Atlas. So you, YouTube, the new Atlas. I hope everyone checks yes. that out. Brian, thanks uh, very much indeed for joining us. I hope you'll join us again. Uh, the poll is now closed and overwhelmingly uh, people think that the events that we are now being treated to are indeed the expected false flag. Whether that false flag will trigger uh, the outcome that uh, the authors of it clearly intend will have to uh, remain to be seen. And whether or not it's the final false flag, whether it's the big false flag, is of course uh, another matter. Now, uh, I'll be back, just myself, on Wednesday, just me and my wife, on Wednesday, which is the Galloway Show. You can get that on my YouTube channel, and it will be at 10 p.m. 10 p.m. on Wednesday nights. For the American audience, it's, uh, it's not perfect, but it's not too late for the British and Europeans, uh, but it's uh, a decent time for the American audience. Uh, it will be hard-hitting. It will bring you up to date with exactly what the situation is on Wednesday. It's me, raw, unvarnished. If you think I'm pretty raw and unvarnished on the mother of all talk shows, you need to see me on Wednesdays at home. Thanks to everyone who donated. If you're watching on Catch Up, you can still donate using PayPal 24 hours a day. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was also for you. <laughs>